Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, obviously a very exciting 24 hours for the club and I know that, that Tom Lawrence, an exceptional uh, CEO of the of the club, you'll be able to see how he and I get on as well, which is important. In a bowl or uh, names and faces. I'm hearing Kevin Watkins there. Can we everybody just be quiet until everybody... When you come in the room, if you start with being quiet and then um, Scott and the guys can help in terms of muting you, but still being able to see. So we're obviously... It, it's new to us all. Zoom, uh, the last 18 months, bear with us. Um, the last 24 hours have been exceptional. Um, they've been exceptional because um, it's the beginning of the end of one chapter <clears throat> and the start of a very exciting chapter for Southend United. Um, the owner believes that, CEO believes that, um, supporters believe that. So I'll just give you an idea of what's happened since the Chesterfield result 4-0. Feel free to take notes. I've also got Shrimp Zone open on my iPad next to me. I've also got Twitter open. So if you want to ask a question on Twitter, save lots of audio issues. Either ask me a question on Shrimp Zone, ask me a, a question on Twitter. Um, I'll be more than happy to, to answer. So the wonders of technology. Um, after the, the Chesterfield game, um, Ron and I spoke, Tom and I spoke. And it was obvious that, this, that it just couldn't go on as was. Um, Phil and his team, Phil and Craig Fagan uh, left the club. I'll leave it to Tom as we go on to explain what's happening with other people at the club. Um, but it was obvious and, uh, something new was needed. My personal view is, is that the status quo of ownership, um, one man employing a manager and that manager comes in and has his tentacles across a whole club have ended. Why? Because modern football, if you want to save money, if you want to streamline costs, if you don't want to be chucking money down a, a hole, then the best way to, to do it is make sure all of your ducks are in a row regarding um, uh, off-field appointments, a CEO. The club didn't have a CEO, let's not forget, until about um, five months ago. Tom's come in, done a few, full due diligence on budgets, what's needed at the club. Um, I've spoken to Tom from the football side and said, I believe that other progressive football clubs have this structure. Um, so we sat down and first thing was first. How was Southend United going to look for the, the, the guy that was going to be able to get on the grass with players that were struggling with confidence um, and that was a clear, thought-out process. So in London last week, uh, Ron Martin, the owner, Gary Lockett, um, was obviously involved with the South End in the community, um, fan of 50 years. Yours truly and Tom had an, a, a, a global list of 18 names. Those 18 names, I have them here, I won't show you them all, but very briefly a document that gave every single thing that they'd done, where they'd been, who they'd been recommended by, uh, what their coaching qualifications were. Um, so we had a group of 18. Some of those guys, um, we all liked. Some of them we said, no, not that the time isn't right. Um, we went into this process with no mates, uh, no mates of mates. Uh, I'll come to the reasons why uh, as we go on. Um, it has to be the best person for the head coach, and I'll come to head coach as opposed to manager as well, person for Southend United Football Club now, today. We want to get out of this division going upwards. Um, it's been brutally obvious that the players haven't been um, coached, have had little structure over a number of managers, not just one, a number of managers. So therefore, they're going into training every day going, what are we doing? Where's the structure? I was invited um, by Jason Dimitriou into the dressing room before the Chertsey game. And I could see, bear in mind you're talking to somebody who's played at a very high level and I've played at the conference level. You could see that they were lacking confidence, lacking the ability to um, be able to express that. I think there was a culture of fear. Uh, not wanting to say anything uh, because they were worried about being 
thrown under the bus. We've heard that many, many times. So players that were struggling with confidence, struggling with form, unwilling to say anything. So when we got together the list, high on the agenda was motivation, ability to coach, set out a structure for Southend United Football Club on the pitch, and everything else was a bonus. We then narrow that down to a list of 10 for interview. And over three days last week, we interviewed all of those guys for up to, in some cases, three, three and a half hours at a time. Um, we all go into everything with our, our own prejudices. He might be my favourite, and this is the reason why. Him, I'm not, not so keen. He hasn't got the experience for this or this. We went in and let the process, let the questions, I asked the football questions, and I'll just give you a few, an idea of some. I've got, I had 35 questions, but I'll give you some. Um, 35 league games to go. What do you believe can be achieved with this group realistically this season? You'd be surprised how few people could answer that. Experienced people couldn't answer that. How would you, how would you describe your team's playing style? What's your preferred system of play? What is your strongest personality trait? Um, give me five words that describe how others would describe your teams. How would you hit the ground running? We've got a fractured fan base, a long-standing chairman, players lacking confidence, a new CEO, bottom three in the table. Where do you start? Could you work with me? What are your weaknesses? How would you deal with Ron if he came into the dressing room? Um, what appeals to you about Southend United, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of technical football questions, lots of common sense questions that will be asked. And I'm sure you guys that have worked in many industries would have asked in interview. Now, it was obvious that across a number of positions, we wanted a head coach, an assistant head coach, and ideally a first team coach. And I was knocking on Tom's door and Tom can, um, can answer himself. I said, could we get all three? Could we get all three positions filled? Um, head coach is important because a manager, for you, a lot of you guys, and we've all had the debates on um, Shrimper Zone and you have the debates amongst you. And there's a lot of people that have old school thinking. Stan, all we need is somebody to roll their sleeves up show these boys a bit of character, look them in the eyes and we go in the trenches. No, we're not at war anymore. When I played, all of those questions were asked about character and bottle and desire because the generation that preceded me had come from war. And football and boot camps and national service have always run alongside each other strangely for many, many years. Um, a lot of football clubs used to actually go to army camps to train. So football and army from the war days have run parallel to each other. Nowadays, you cannot speak to 17 to 25 year olds in the way that some managers speak to some of these young men. So we had to have people inside the dressing room that understood young people, how they are motivated and how they respond to things. So um, head coach is important because it tells you quite clearly what their title is. They are the head coach of the team. They're not the CEO. They're not deciding on 25 different parameters across the club. They are there to coach the team, to motivate, to give structure. And that's the first team coaching network. Um, in terms of the characters, we all agreed in the uh, interview process that Kevin Mayer, his presentation was, um, I've sat in on hundreds of interviews um, in businesses that I'm involved in, football interviews, you name it, was the best presentation pound for pound I have seen. He came in and again, we all have our prejudices. Can he do it at this? Could he do it at that? Could she do that? Could you? And he came in and he identified the age difference in much of the squad. We've got lots of good youngsters. We've got some towards the, the older age groups. 
lacking. And he put it, he had a PowerPoint presentation, but he nailed it. We're lacking in the correct median age for a professional football squad. He nailed how players that are not going to be playing week in and week out in the first team, how they're going to top up their minutes in training during the week. So they're going to get, so that when they come into a first team, if somebody's injured, um, they're fit and ready. Not that they haven't played for five or six or eight weeks. And then they come in, everybody expects them to um, pull up trees, but they're not fit. He has a full month by month quality training schedule to be able to get these guys minutes on the pitch and minutes at the training ground. Um, in terms of Darren Curry, lots of you are asking questions and we'll come to the questions. Um, why Darren Curry he might be, he was surely in the frame as a number one. We interviewed being very flexible as to the panel sit down and say, we think he's a one. We think he's a number two. We think he'd be really good at this stage in his career as a first team coach. That's based on due diligence, not plucking names out the air, that he managed 76 games at Barnet or he's um, Bristol Rovers under 23s. We took away what they gave us. We had a sane and sensible conversation process between the four of us, which was exceptional. I really want to thank Tom for his vision. I want to thank Gary for his input from a supporter's perspective. And I want to thank Ron for taking one quarter ownership on that panel. He didn't interfere. He didn't interject. He didn't say, thank you, patronise us. Thank you, guys. I'll make the decision. He was one quarter of the process. And he called me this evening to thank me for my part in that process and how happy he is that that process is now bore fruit. So that's Kevin Mayer. His presentation for Southend United in the here and now was exceptional. The best presentation I've seen. On top of that, he's a legendary ex-player. On top of that, um, he has a very good network of people that he can help bring to the table. But let's not mince our words here, ladies and gentlemen. He was the best man for the job in an interview process that, of people that had, had managed or coached in the Premier League, in the Championship, in League One, in League Two, in the National Conference, in Conference South, in Conference North and below. He was the best man for the job. That's it. I don't care about anything else. He's the best man for the job. Uh, so Darren Curry, we asked every candidate, could you work with him? Could you work with him? What do you think? What are your thoughts on him? We, of course, want people to work well together, but... The word professional in front of footballer means that if I walk on the pitch with Robbie Fowler and we don't get on very well, we can still have output. If I work in, walk into Roots Hall and there's Brett Angel and we don't know each other from a hole in the wall, we can play well together. It's amazing how many fans go, well, crikey, yeah, they're going to work together. They've never worked together before. That's welcome to professional football. On your, your UEFA pro license, you are invited to do your pro license as an individual, not as mates, not as a threesome or a foursome. So of course we want people to work together that are comfortable working together. But Kev got together with Benno this week, had a coffee, uh, hadn't really spoke much with each other over recent years, hit it off very well, but they had an adult professional conversation about working together, and they were both excited to work together. Darren Curry, likewise, um, wants to get back on the grass, wants to improve footballers. We believe it will be very, very good for Southend in that regard. And Benno um, watched a lot of footage, heard a lot in the local area about what he's done at Canvey, taking them to the top of the league. We heard from the horse's mouth the kind of budgets he was working with, but he said, Southend United gave me my first pro contract. I want to give something back and I'm very excited. I'm ambitious. Uh, one manager of the month as well um, is a teacher at the moment. So he works with 16 to 18 year olds. Exactly. If you can get into their heads, the younger generation, Generation Z, Millennials, whatever you want to call it, that's an added bonus. But all three men individually have the qualifications. All three men as a growing unit, um, we believe and have done our due diligence 
to know that they can work together. Um, Scott, do you want to bring in Tom here? Um, Tom Lawrence, yeah. our CEO. Yeah, Tom, so if you want to take yourself off mute and you want to uh, have some input here, I'm sure you're, well, you're more than welcome, of course. So, you there, Tom? Hey, Scott. Yeah, I, I'm here. I'm in a noisy environment at the moment, so I've heard some of what um, Stan has said, but not all of it. Um, but I heard about the recruitment process that Stan outlined, which has been a structured process which we've gone through, which is sort of, it's a bit of a, akin to a corporate environment, dialed back a bit because it's football. But from a non-footballing person, I wanted to have that structure in place um, and a process in place, which I think worked really well, as Stan uh, said, the four of us together, uh, I think we've got the right result. Well, I'm sure we've got the right result. And it was um, it was good because we had a real good mix. Obviously, Stan could push the candidates on the footballing side of matters, which, uh, if frankly Gary, uh, Ron, or I had done that, it would have not been credible. Um, so I think, um, as Stan has said, we've got the right team, having gone through a uh, structured process. Tom, thank you. Um, I want to move things on to to where we're at now, we know the team is looking and moving forward. Um, Scott, can you hear me? Can it, yeah, I can hear you, Stan, no problem. Okay, perfect, thank you, Tom. So Tom just outlined there that it was a structured process and what we wanted to do was to achieve, ev listening to everybody. We learned a lot from the guys that didn't make the cut. We learned a lot from the guys that were interviewed that, that we then had to send messages to, and Tom's done that, and I've done that over the last couple of days. Thank you very much for taking part in this um, process. We've decided to go down this road. Please keep in touch. The, all the very best from Stan Collymore, Tom Lawrence, and Southend United Football Club. Again, that matters. Professionalism, um, courtesy, respect. So we've dealt with the coaching um, angle. Um, I'm going to go to some of the questions, Scott, if I may. And then we'll come back and and because we're going to cover a lot of these topics. So it's very good to be able to hear from the supporters. I'll just finish with the process was a thought out and structured process where every candidate had time to be able to make their presentation. And we have got three guys through a rigorous process that we believe are the very best guys now to be able to coach and move Southend United forward. Uh, I see Liam Clark there. Liam, um, please go ask your question. Take yourself off unmute. Uh, hi, Stan. Thank you very much again for uh, for allowing us to come on to, uh, this evening. Um, just quickly, vaguely as well, um, you spoke about the way that Ron Martin allowed you as sort of a four to be able to bring someone into the club and bring three people into the club, especially, which um, a lot of the fans didn't expect and it really took us by surprise. But uh, in regards to Ron Martin and your position moving forward, of course, you've had a massive influence on the managerial aspects, et cetera, all behind the scenes. Where do you move from now? Are you going to uh, stick with the club? Are you going to see where the fans go and see how the, the play goes? Or are you going to really sort of have a more of a role uh, behind the sort of club? OK, I'll answer that question uh, straight and direct. And I'll, I'll bring Tom in uh, off the back of it. I know Tom's in a very noisy environment, so I, I don't want to put him any in any... Um... Dan, can I just cut a question? I mean, if anyone else has a question, they can put their hand up by uh, the little icon up in the top. Yeah, you can put your hand up. I mean, I can see Liam and Michelle doing yeah. that, but I can't see others because I can only see seven or eight people on the top of my screen. Yeah, the ones with their hand up will go to the top, so you'll see them and we can Fantastic. take them. Okay. So, there you go. You've answered the question. If you've got a question... There's a put your hand up feature on uh, Zoom. Put your hand up. Brian, I'm going to get to questions on Shrimper's own and on Twitter as well. Uh, Liam, very good question. So my situation uh, was that I've spoken to all of the main supporters groups and I asked them about a week or two ago, do I have your support if there was a role offered to me at Southend United? And it was very nice and very humbling that all of the supporters groups said, um, yes, we do. I think that was important. We've had a situation that, and um, uh, the because of, of the manager getting sacked, because there's 35 games left, because there was an important cup tie that we wanted to win. I've played for Southend United at Huddersfield. I've played when there's 5,000 shrimpers 
in the Leppings Lane end at Hillsborough, 5,000 balloons, fifth round of the FA Cup, so I know how important it is for this, this club, is that I said to Tom, park my situation, um, and I said this to Ron and Tom in London in the meeting last week, park my situation until the main men are, are on board. Uh, there are other positions as well, uh, head of recruitment, scouting, I'm on a, a document making at Southend the future document. So I've been very busy and I've been doing it for you guys. And I know I've said recently that I've done it for nothing. And I have done it for nothing. That's great. No problem. No, no big deal either. Um, I do it because I want the club to move forward. The situation is very clear. I'm going to Roots Hall tomorrow. Uh, I'm meeting Tom. I had a phone call with Tom and Ron just before this call. Tom wanted to jump on. And we are sitting down with a view to discuss a role at the club. I gave a title, a working title, Head of Football Operations, because it covers everything from supporter engagement, club building, recruitment, scouting, supporting the coaches at the football club. Um, things that I've mentioned to you guys before, if we're in a three-way bun fight with Colchester United or Arsenal for that great young player, I turn up with my Southend United jacket on, come to us. We're your home. But the best person to answer that question from the horse's mouth is, is Tom Lawrence. Tom, are you there? Um, so the question Liam asked is, um, do I have a role and are we going to get any role sorted in the near future, I guess, to uh, yeah. um, We've um, gone backwards and forwards between Stan's representative and I, and we've got a working agreement in process, which we're looking to finalise tomorrow. So Stan's been a great asset and great help, and we're looking to formalise that agreement um, tomorrow. Tom, thank you. So the answer to the question is, I know that lots of people have asked it on um, multiple forums, is that uh, subject to um, Tom and I agreeing... Guys, I need you to turn off televisions and radios, please. Um, is that subject to an agreement tomorrow at Roots Hall that uh, if there's a fair wind blowing on the day that I will be the head of football operations at Southend United Football Club from tomorrow. Well, that's Michelle. We're happy with that, I'll tell you that. Michelle, please ask your question. Well, first of all, congratulations on the job. Um, the second question is, though, how are we afforded all of this? Obviously, with all the restructuring that's happening, um, we don't have the best financial reputation as it is. What's changed and, you know, how is it, how is it going to be afforded? Tom Lawrence, I'm going to bring you back in, please, as the Chief Executive Officer. I've seen lots of the numbers completely out of my remit, uh, but I've seen the job that Tom's done. Tom, how can the South End United Football Club afford these hires? That's an interesting question. So the football club um, loses money annually and we're supported by group companies. The business plan that's been put together maximises income streams uh, to the best of our abilities and reduces um, reduces costs to the best of our abilities. Combination of the two things means that we are becoming leaner, which has given us um, additional cash to spend on things like a three-man coaching team. Um, but we will still be making uh, losses. Uh, we're not going to um, get into a sustainable uh, position until we move away from Roots Hall Stadium. Tom, thank you. Um, Ken Taylor, please. Ken, take yourself off, off mute. You got, Ken, you got to take yourself off mute. Yeah, sorry, it didn't click. It didn't click off. Okay, um, first of all, yeah, thanks uh, all you, you've been doing, Stan, with, along with the other, your three colleagues during the last week or so. Um, I think mainly you pretty pretty much already answered most of this. I think... It was just about what tipped the balance to the three guys you ended up selecting. What was the tipping point? If you say uh, very good question. And I think that um, 
we all sat down the panel <clears throat> and the football business, I believe, is full of lots of different characters, uh, lots of different methodology, but there's one thing that holds true, is that modern progressive football clubs have a structure, have an identity, and know where they want to go. At the top of that, you'd say Brentford. I've played against Brentford for Southend in the Championship. Similar sized club. Is that they have an identity and a structure that is unique to Brentford. They're not trying to be Manchester United or Liverpool, nor are they trying to be Forest Green Rovers or Harrogate. They looked at their set of circumstances and said, how can we maximise player sales to be able to generate revenue for the club? We're going to get rid of the under-23s team uh, because it doesn't serve us very well. There aren't many coming through from that system. So we're going to have a B team, the best youngsters, players not in the match day squad. We're going to build a stadium that is suitable for us, that can generate noise and generate atmosphere. We're going to listen to what the supporters want. So in our mind, when we're at the start of a, of a process that hopefully will be take us all the way through into um, Fawcett's Farm and beyond, is that you're looking at people, um, employees of the football club, that of course have the football club at heart. I think that's a real bonus with Kevin Mayer. He'll do the extra yards. Ben O will do the extra yards. I'll do the extra yards. I've done the extra yards. Tom, Tom Lawrence is a South End fan, will do the extra yards. But the important thing about Tom Lawrence is he's a lawyer. He has to adhere to the bar of England. So there's no messing around. There's no shady people coming in that, that, that you can't hold to account. Accountability, asking me questions, looking in my eyes. Stan, you said this. You said this six months ago. We're going to hold you to it. Honesty, integrity. Um, and I think at South End United Football Club over the years, that has been lacking. That high bar of who we are, a club built by its supporters, a stadium built by its supporters, to be able for, for the local community to be able to watch football. If you can start from that first seed of what the club was founded on, everything else is really easy because you hold people accountable. So, for example, the three coaches, if none of them could have worked with another group or other people that they hadn't worked with, that automatically makes me suspicious. Think now, all of you, of a managerial group in the Premier League, the Championship League One, League Two, that have carried the same blokes around with them for 30 years. If we're doing an interview process and asking a manager to tell us everything about his credentials and about his honesty and about his integrity, why, when we employ him, do we give a free pass to six or seven people that come with him without interview? So we interview everybody for every position and we ask them the same questions. What can you bring to the club? Show us your integrity, show us your honesty. So Ken, the, the values that those three guys brought over and above uh, their ability, Kev Mayer is a UEFA Pro Licence Coach, the gold standard. I believe Ben O's uh, A license. Darren, I think the same, might be pro license. So you, you're automatically talking about a bar that's been set in terms of their qualifications. But Kevin Mayer is a man of integrity. Um, ben O spoke to him, loving to bits already, a man of the, the greatest and utmost integrity. And likewise, Darren Curry. If you put those three guys together, they're going to act with integrity. So that's why I think a lot of South End United fans are excited. It's not a homecoming. It's not a homecoming here. I said to you guys six months ago, this is what I can bring to your club. I can facilitate lots of really good changes because I've, I've, I have got, beside the sort of, oh, it's Stan Collymore, what's he like? Is that my contacts book and my 1,500 games in the last 12 years, analysing them, got a lot of currency in the bank with a lot of clubs, on relationship building with those clubs. Can they get us the best players? Come to Southend first. We'll look after them. We'll show them the way. If you've got a loanee, he's not going to be thrown under the bus by a, by a manager, an all-great, all-seeing manager. He's going to be coached. He's going to be developed so that you'll send us more down the line. So, Ken, the answer is integrity, honesty, qualifications 
and being open to be able to um, work with other people. That's, that's what defines a professional. All of you guys, the industries that you work with, the, when you walk in on day one, you don't say, hey, I've brought me five mates with me uh, at my desk. They're all going to sit. You go in and you, you, you're working with people you don't know. It's your professionalism that creates the bonds and the, that you work somewhere for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. Football just doesn't, isn't used to doing that. This guy brings his entourage with him and that entourage may not be good enough for what we're looking for. So the three guys are more than good enough for what we're looking for. Sensei Phil, uh, very good evening to you. Uh, please ask a question. Evening, Stan. Thanks for all you're doing. Um, just a quick one, really. If the coaching team are successful, as I expect them to be, um, it sounds like it was a fantastic interview process. So, you know, congratulations to, the, to you all. We're all. I think we're all quite excited. Um, but if they are successful to be, as we expect them to be, what's to stop a bigger club with financial pulling power taking South End's best? You know, how does the board go about protecting this project while we're trying to get back into the Football League? And that includes yourself as well, Stan. Yeah, um, I can give you a guarantee that the only three clubs that I've ever offered help to are Southend United, uh, to Ron back in 2003 when Tilly got the job, Aston Villa getting answers to a, a plethora of ownership issues prior to recent owners joining, <coughs> and Nottingham Forest. Um, I have absolutely no interest of doing this job for anybody else other than Southend United. I'm happy, I can pay my milk bill, um, I spend a lot of time abroad, uh, I love doing so, but I have parked everything because I want to help the club. So you, there's, there's no, if I'm crap, you'll be saying get out anyway. If I'm really good, it'll be leaving Southend, hopefully in a better position. You make a really good point about insulating and protecting our assets. One of the things that we want to do in terms of, we're talking to a head of recruitment that again, interviewed exceptionally all of the guys agreed um incredible qualifications on the grass qualifications generally building organizations up from the ground up building businesses football businesses from the ground up and we're having ongoing discussions with him um and one of his key things is development of the pathway we don't want to lose south end united's best youngsters uh, before their time academy serves the club that, that those youngsters then get in the first team or they go on loan. Um, and it's exactly the same with our best and brightest staff. We want to um, develop people in the club to be able to go on to bigger and better things. But we want to do it on our time scale, not on other clubs' time scale. And a club that's in a distressed position, of course, is always then um, exposed to having people picked off a robust organisation, not so much so. We club build, we make people happy in the building at Roots Hall and Boots and Laces. I went round before the game, how are you? Getting feedback, how can we help you? How can we, what can we do for you to make your experience as an employee better? And the smiles that have got back, nobody's asked us that before, Stan. Um, it'd be nice to see somebody and somebody to say hello now and again, you know, by getting people out of their environment once a month, once every six weeks, once every two two months. Making South End somewhere people want to stay, not want to leave. And Fawcett's Farm and the, and the stadium, I'm not getting in the, the politics of it, but the reality is it's a 22,000 seat stadium and we've got a 18, 19,000 fill, or filling it, is that that's a place where people are going to want to stay. You know, we've all seen old decrepit grounds and I love the hall, I love it. Made me debut, Notts County. I walked back there the other day in the cup game. And I'm like, it's not changed. It's amazing. I love it. Stay there forever. But we also have to progress. But to answer your question about the coaching staff, <clears throat> one of the beauties of having a system whereby you're employing Kevin Mayer, um, Mark Bentley and Darren Curry, if somebody comes in and says to Kev, we're going to make you an offer you, you can't refuse at Man United, we're not destroying the whole ecosystem of the club and seven people are automatically going out of the door. We retain individual services of others, unless, you know, 
the three of them get on so well that in two years' time, they do see themselves as a team that travel everywhere and Man United take them. But I'll tell you one thing, and I know that Tommy's very big on this. We will have an updated player plan. So we will have every single identifiable player, and this is where the head of recruitment is excellent, uh, gave us a basket of players. This is where we're short. These are the players that are available to extricate from under 23s or other clubs. They're available now, Stan. Chop, chop. So I call the clubs Stan Collymore here. That, that's the last currency. <clears throat> we get them in. Likewise, coaches. We have an updated system of the next head coach, the next head coach beyond that, and the next head coach beyond that. We have, we have a future-proof plan so that we aren't left short in any, in, in any area. And that goes for, for Tom Lawrence. You know, he's a South End fan. He lives in the area. But he's an excellent CEO. We got him from Gillingham, a league, you know, league one club. If Manchester United come in for him, we've got to have in this South End United, the future document, which I'm three quarters of the way through, a strategy to say, right, that's the kind of man we're looking for. We've already got him identified. Let's go and make an approach for him. So we're always, whether it be with players, whether it be coaches, staff around the club, we're thinking two or three ahead. That's not disrespectful to Kev. It's not disrespectful to me. I'd expect exactly the same in terms of if I agree a position tomorrow, that a head of football operations, that we are thinking, and I would help. He, he could do what I do in two years' time. Get him in. He's 45. I'm 50. Get him in. He's got great contacts. So it's, it's future-proofing the club by planning ahead, Kev. Thank you very much for your question. Paul Alexander, please. Hi, Sam. Just want to thank you as well for doing all the stuff you've been doing. Really appreciate it. Um, you mentioned before about a DNA for the club as well, a style of play, a, you know, a new South and United. You, you mentioned Phil Brown didn't really have a, a style of play as such. Where's that style of play going to come from? Is it going to come from Kevin, the guys, or is it coming as a collective now, you know, with you involved? What's going to be a DNA? Is it dictated by the players? Where's it going Yeah, from? very good point. Um, excellent point, actually. <clears throat> It's no good us turning around and saying we want to play like Pep Guardiola's 2011 Barcelona because it's not going to happen. I'm a pragmatist. I played for Liverpool, pass and move. I played for Crystal Palace, which was a, a modern updated version of the crazy gang, really, the, the Crystal Palace team that I played in. Southend was a, a hybrid. All, all clubs I've played for have had different philosophies and ethoses. We want to get to a position whereby Southend United supporters go and watch a team in a stadium and we're on the front foot, we're attacking, and it's a multifaceted way of playing. I don't particularly like Tiki Taka. I don't like lumping it up into a, a big front man. You want to have a, a football team that addresses the realities on the pitch as they present themselves. The one great thing about Kev and his presentation was, I said to him, you know, are you, uh, what's your philosophy? And he looked at the squad. We all looked at the squad. We looked at every single player that we've got in the positions that they play. He said, let's address the first things first, Stan. Confidence, motivation, structure, and, and some discipline. Once we've addressed that, we can find out what the players' strengths are. Once we've identified what the players' strengths are, some will come in and some will leave the club, the natural process of a football club. But I'm not wet. And what I loved about Kev was he's not wedded to one system that goes, we're going to play it out the back when somebody's got two feet that's receiving it in, in the back four. We're going to look at the play, assess the player's strengths. That's the coaching. Nothing to do with me. We've employed some people at Southend that we believe have the requisite qualifications to be able to leave them to it. We'll be having meetings every two weeks and say, how are you developing him? What do you need, Kev? What can we give you? But it will be more collegiate. Two heads are better than one, one head is better, et cetera. We don't want it a Politburo of 10 people sitting around Ron's desk and, and talking about every single playing decision. We've employed people at the football club that we believe are qualified to do their part of the, of the bargain. But there will also be accountability. <laughs> so to answer your question about on-pitch style, we've got to get results. We've got to breathe confidence into the, into the players. And then after a proper assessment period, there's over 100 points to play for. So no panic. Um, but we want to get results starting at the weekend. 
is that the style of Southend United Football Club, the club will wag the tail. It won't be this guy comes in that wants to play like Pep Guardiola's Barcelona 2011, and then the next guy comes in and he wants character bottle throwing it into the channels. There's no point. It doesn't work. It's not, it's not consistent. And then you're having to chuck out a load of players, which costs the club money. So the, I'm not ignoring the question. Give the coaching staff time to be able to assess what the abilities of the players are. And then we move forward from there. And we move forward on the basis that an ideal South End United team is combative, is um, on the front foot, entertaining, uh, plays with width, plays with strikers that, you know, all the things that we all love. But we're not going to be wedded to. Oh, Stanley, Stanley. <laughs> all right. Oh, can I, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dad. Um, we're not going to be wedded to. We play it out the back and we try to play pretty patterns if that's not what we've got, Paul. It will reveal itself by the, by the hires that the club makes. So go and do your due diligence about Kev, asking questions. We'll be getting Kev on some of these uh, town halls and I think that we'll, we'll be doing them as regularly as supporters want. He will tell you how he wants his teams to play. Benno will tell you how we, how, this is how, what we tried to do at Canvey. We tried to entertain people, turning up in a windy, you know, 300 people on Canvey Island. I wanted to play in this way. So they can answer that much, much better, but it will be attacking, aggressive, combative, competitive, <laughs> and um, in, the, in, the, in the way and the style that Southend United fans, understanding what Southend United fans want, we are listening. So I'm a very big believer in when I came to the club, this is what I brought and I thought it was exciting there and then and people got off their seats and they enjoyed it. We want to give you the same. Uh, Perry, um, young man there, nice to see some young shrimpers. Uh, please ask your question. Not that young, Stan, uh, thank you. Um, but uh, my question was, you alluded to at the start of the call um, that you asked all the candidates sort of what do they think is achievable was there, from the panel's point of view, an answer which was acceptable or was deemed sort of right, um, to which you selected, obviously, the three that you have so far? Great question. The, um, we, we looked at how many games are left. 35 games, over 100 points. Um, we want to consolidate our position very quickly. Um, we're only eight or nine games in, so when you look at tables and you see bottom three, it's not the same as bottom three, obviously, after 20 games. Consolidate our position. At the same time, there's going to be an assessment of the squad and of needs. What do we need? Um, Kev looked, and we all looked at the at the squad, the depth, the strength, the individuals, the age. Um, who wants to go? Who wants to stay? And there are areas that we need to improve on. Um, but consolidation is first. Um, we need to be humble, ladies and gentlemen. We there's, there's, a, there's a very understandable, we're a football league club, we have been for 100 years, we've gone down, hey, all we need is a bloke to roll his sleeves up and, excuse my French, we'll piss it. No, we're a conference club. I played for Stafford Rangers in this division in front of 300 every week. And I went into it with a mindset of, I've just been released by Wolves. I've been at Wolves. This is a doddle. This is a struggled for the first six months and it was only when the penny dropped that I have to be humble enough to do what everybody else does in this division and then my abilities will reveal themselves on top that I started to make progression. South End United club, uh, Football Club is a conference club with many, many things. Its supporters are the main asset that can help us move forward. But we are a conference club. We will be humble, we will be honest and we will move forward on that basis. And I think there's been far too much talk of the next Messiah's come, get us up out of this division. It's going to be really easy. We'll, we'll outwork other clubs on and off the pitch. We'll outthink other football clubs on the, on, the, on, uh, on the pitch. We will respect other football clubs on the pitch and that will consolidate us. And only at a point when we can consolidate and the coaches come to us and go, we're happy with the group that we've got now, that Tom says... And Ron says, OK, we're, next, we're ready to push on to the next level. And I think that's, a again, honest approach rather than sitting here and going, 
oh, we've just got three, we've got, we've got the three amigos in. Look how great they are. Look how well they talk. We're going to go up, consolidate first, and then move forward after. Jason, please ask your question. Jason Rodwell, good evening. Take yourself off mute, pal. Hiya, Sam. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. So my question is more about, obviously, you, you're a great player, and when you came out of that, you seem to have built this massive network with professionals. Uh, how do you see networking as an attribute to moving the club forward? Massive. It, um, yeah. I'll answer the question. And, 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 and sorry, can yeah. that be brought into the club culture? Yes. Um, Tom Lawrence um, was insistent when we spoke, because I, I took Tom to Ron. I heard via networking that Tom might be available from Gillingham. He could have stayed at Gillingham and he could be Gillingham CEO now. But I knew he was a South End supporter. I knew he lived in the area. So I contacted him and I said, would you be interested in being the CEO of South End United? Yes, I would. And so I took him to Ron at Ron's house. Ron gave him the job. And honestly, guys, he's been excellent. He will show you all of the, the bean counting and the, and the strategy and what he's trying to achieve. It's really impressive. And I'm saying that we're not mates. We're not golfing buddies. He's got a professional relationship with me. I, him, I like him. He likes me. But he'll say to me, Stan, I don't think, I don't think we should do that. And I'll say, I don't think we should go down that direction. It's a respect. Networking is huge. Um, it's another buzzword that people go, oh, crikey, Stan, bloody hell, I'm 75 years old. Just get the manager in that can roll his sleeves up and make a couple of calls to Harry Redknapp and to uh, Sam Allardyce, and we sort it. doesn't work like that anymore. We're in one of the most competitive football environments ever for players, for free transfers, for under 23s. Um, and I took it on myself, a little bit cheekily, to already try and establish relationships with um, clubs in the Premier League, Championship, League One and League Two. Um, some of these guys I'll have played with that might be head of the under 23s at this club. Other people, it might be the fact that I played for that club. Other people, it might be, uh, I don't know, but I've respected and they respect me and that we've come up, we've crossed paths many times. It's massive. Um, to get to the front of the queue to get players for this football club, to get to the front of the queue to get a CEO for this football club, to get to the front of the queue to be able to have a process to get the best head coach, that's where we'll be. I, I guarantee it. And again, I don't ever get involved in anything that I can't do because I'm in a fortunate position I don't have to. And I don't mean that by trying to say it's about money. I'm happy in my life. I've um, got a wonderful family. Um, I'm doing things that I want to do that involve me traveling and, and doing projects globally, which I love doing. But all of every single contact has been brought to bear for South End United. If, if we get the head of recruitment over the line, the first thing I'll be doing is going on social media and, and shrimp zone and say, this is what the guy's done. And you'd be going, if that was Manchester City, it, it, it would make sense. I can get him to South End United. And he wants to come to South End United because he trusts me. He's had an interview process. Ron's interviewed him, had a Zoom call. Club have interviewed him, presented very well. I want you to have the very best people, not the, the, the tenth pick of a loanee or the sixth and pick of a CEO. I just don't... Uh, we need to be at the, the, at the front, and we will be at the front. And how do we introduce that vision into the culture of the club, Stan? We have, we have an identifiable plan. One of the things about bringing supporters on board, and um, these, these conversations are really important because you, it's a chance to ask questions and a chance to get real answers um, is that the supporters are as important as a CEO, as important as any player, as important as any coach. And in my philosophy, in terms of a culture at the club, you guys will stand alongside those are the core planks of the club to be heard, to be listened to. What are our facilities like? What about this stand? We're a little bit worried about the finances. Tom's answered that. A little bit worried about this, I can answer it from a football perspective, is that a culture document, South End United, the future, is coming. And everybody will see it. 
Um, it will be openly available, whether it be on the club website or whether it be, I come down to South End and we have events where there's two or 300 represented. I like this because if there's 300 or 400 here and some of you only go on Shrimper Zone or only go on Twitter and said, my mate Dave told me that Stan Collymore promised that our next manager had National League experience. I didn't. I said he'll have knowledge of the league. All three of them have got knowledge of not just the National League, but higher and lower. So you can hear it from my mouth. But Southend United will consistently now be at the front of the queue for things to build relationships, not at the back. And my network is as good as anybody in association football in England today. I guarantee it. Kev, um, please ask, ask your question. Oh, evening. Thank, congratulations again, Stan. And thank you second time round, because I saw every game you played for us first time round. My question is, um, what you said earlier about the um, about Kev Mayer identifying the median age lack in our squad, yeah. which means obviously w w that would be, for me, a priority yes. to start working on. If that's a priority... Bearing in mind that we must have people that have signed contracts this summer that may not fit the bill, how do we change the squad to get it performing how we want it to in the time scale we've got to do in 35 games to make a difference and consolidate ourselves in this league? Fantastic question, Kev. Um, the answer is, is that Kev, Darren and Benno work on the grass. Um, they will identify very quickly. We've got three rather than one, so they will all be giving each other input. Um, if everything's agreed tomorrow with Tom and the club, I will be coming down at least weekly, but bi-weekly meetings. Who's developing? Who's not developing? What areas are we short? And once I give, uh, it, hopefully get the green light tomorrow, I'll be on the phone tomorrow to clubs. We need this. Kev, what do you think of him? Fantastic. What do you think of this? Fantastic. No, no to that. We don't quite. And we'll be the beauty of the National League is there's still plenty of there's hundreds of players out of contract. It's not like the Premier League where you've got a January transfer window. We can act and be very flexible with 23s, for example, um, around the country. Um, there'll be clubs that want their players to go out on loan ASAP um, to good progressive football clubs that work with coaches that develop them rather than a manager that says you're crap you ain't playing these are it, it all fills it feeds into each other we're going to leave it to the coaching staff to be able to make sure that they have time to assess the squad to be able to see what strengths that we are but not leaving us short in in results kev at all if there are areas that need immediate improvement um the head of potential new head of recruitment, myself, uh, Kevin, the technical staff will be all across it. There'll be there'll be some very experienced people across it from day one. We we'll guarantee it. Brilliant. Thanks, Stan. Confident You're welcome, field. Peter. Good evening. You need to take yourself off mute first, pal. All well, right, I can hear me. I can hear you very well. Good evening. Yeah, thanks. It's great seeing you again. Um, you. I know we've touched on recruitment. Over the years, as most of us know, the recruitment has been pretty poor. Um, are we going to have a new head of recruitment or is it you? No, I'm not the head of recruitment. Is Tom Lawrence still around? He did say that. <laughs> <laughs> He's not. He said he had to go. He, he had meetings at quarter nine, so I'll answer it as best as possible. Um, in the interview process in London, um, we wanted to, in, 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 because of the urgency of the situation um, and because we knew that there was a lot of hard work to do, it wasn't just a case about getting a very linear process, or an idea of we just need a head coach. We wanted to look how many could we could bring in within our budget, whether that would be supported by the budget and the owner and associated companies. And we also looked at scouting, uh, and recruitment. Again, a, a great little story. A Premier League head non-league scout of a really good club, progressive club in the Premier League, contacted me last week and said, I'm going to Wilston against Dagenham. Um, I'm a South End United fan. And would you like me to drop on your lap a um, opposition scouting report? Yes, please. It was soup to nuts. 
that's been passed on to Kev, so will give us a better, a better idea of how Dagenham play, their strengths, their weaknesses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In terms of the recruitment department, I put a name, a couple of names, but one name in particular in front of Ron, Gary, and Tom. He was interviewed in London on the same day as some of the uh, head coach candidates, assistant head coach candidates, first team coach candidates, and his presentation was incredible. His achievement in football, um, in various roles, A class. His understanding and knowledge of under 23s, I mean, he goes into such, such depth that he's got every under 23 player in the country, how many loans they've been on. Now, that might not sound that, that sexy, but the, there's a prevailing orthodoxy that. A second loan, taking a player on their second loan or third loan is better than their first. Why? You come out of, let's say, Aston Villa, club I support. It's your first loan. You've gone from the Bodymore Heath training complex, jacuzzis, baths, training pitches coming out of every orifice, and you come to boots and laces. Automatically, you're like, I've got to get used to this. Second loan, they're used to it. Third loan, they, they, they have a, a very broad understanding, if they're going to go lower, what they're dealing with. So he rates people. He's on his first loan stand. We might not, and the data suggests this, and there's not just data, it's quali quality data based on, and he runs a, one of the best data companies in, football data companies in the country. He has every single qualification from FA mentoring, He's a UEFA Pro Licensed Coach. This could be our head of recruitment. He's also a UEFA Pro Licensed Coach. So um, he's away at the moment. Um, he gets back in the coming days. It was his, uh, a big birthday of his uh, in the recent days. So he, prior to getting involved with us, it was a, a, a pre-organised, uh, pre-planned event. So um, Tom is on board. Ron is on board. Gary's on board. Um, if we get this guy, he will be as important higher for Southend United that they've had in the last 10 years. And he is A class. If he popped up at Manchester City, I'd say, yeah, makes complete sense. So, again, qualified, qualified in a number of areas, bringing the very, very best um, players from across the country to our, to our attention, Peter. Well, thanks, Dan. You're like a breath of fresh air. Thank you very much. Andy, uh, it's, uh, the, uh, the, the Players Association, where's, where's my LNX shirt? <laughs> It'll be with you. Um, it's going to Tom. It'll be with Tom next Tuesday. Fantastic. Um, um, and, very warm uh, welcome. Please ask a question. Thank you. Um, in running the ex-players group, we're now at 326 members, of which you are one. Um, makes us one of the top five in the country. It's a huge asset. It's an asset that shows it cares, and that, I think, is something that's been missing in the club ethos um, for some time, but will be, is going to be built on. How important, especially in your head of football operations role, do you see making use of this asset with, with the club? Vital. I've been in bed the last couple of nights uh, imagining Billy Best, um, Crowney, Benjamin, Spinner when he gets his arse back from Australia coming out before a game, taking the applause of the supporters, coming up and giving us their thoughts and opinions on how the club is developing. Um, we want to get the playing staff across the board, as well as former players, into the community. I think there are built bridges to be built with local and national business uh, that, that former players and current players can do much more, uh, notwithstanding the fact that they are primarily players or people that ex-players that are coming to join us maybe for a day or for a, a couple of days but we want to tap into um a, an incredibly rich resource of experience um of warmth of a, 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 a real emotional bond with south end united and we want to run with it we make no bones here this is not just about coaching a first team to get better results which of course fans want it is about building a football club whereby one of the reasons I was reading, a, a, it was 2017, I did a bit with Chris, um, uh, Chris Phillips. I don't know whether, I think Chris is in the room. 
And you can read it, I'll post it on Twitter. And it says, the, the six months at, at Southend United were the happiest of my career. And they were the happiest of my career because although the club was then going through a tough time, big Jobson, low crowds, and then we built it up and built up, even in, in that season, 13,000 nearly against West Ham, got a really good point of it against Kevin Keegan's um, entertainers, is that everybody off the pitch had a smile. How are you, Stan? We're here to help. Um, Colin Murphy brought me into the club, but Bobby Houghton, that was only his assistant for one day, said, we believe in you. And that's going back to me going around the club. How are you? What can we do? How can we, how can we make the, the working environment better for you? And there has been a culture that has been very negative at the football club. And so to tap into your resource of former players that are aching in many cases to be heard themselves. They want to come down. They want to offer um, a word here or go and meet supporters there. So Andy, you're pushing an open door here. Uh, in the community, the Shrimpers Trust and the former, uh, former Players Association, as well as the other supporters groups, will be key planks to what goes on at Southend United moving forward. Thank you. Cheers. Um, Liam Clark, please. Liam, good, after good evening. Hey, Liam, take yourself off mute. You've already answered my, uh, my right. Okay, we'll go, right. Well, I don't want you to be greedy. We, we, <laughs> you're a very talented young man. Don't worry. I've noticed your work as well. I'll be in, in touch with you about that. The question, Danny. Danny, 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 uh, Danny, 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 Danny. Is Danny there? Danny McAvoy. Take yourself off mute. The blue voice. It isn't me, Stan. It's another Danny. All right. I'm going to ask you your question then. It just says Danny, uh, Dan McAvoy, the blue voice. So would you like to ask a question? Take yourself off mute then. Yeah. yeah, we've got a question. Go on then, chaps. Good evening. Hello, Stan. Met you on Saturday before the Chelsea game. Um, medically wise, the club's been without a proper physio yes. for some time now. Is there anything in the pipeline to uh, rectify that? I brought this up in some of the meetings with um, in London. Um, I think it's fair to say that a professional football club um, that has its fair share of injuries, as all professional football clubs do, need a full-time physio. Uh, I know that that's a very important issue for Tom, and I believe that that will be uh, addressed in the coming weeks. Good, thanks. Eden. Good evening. I just see. Uh, let's get Danny. Is it first on my screen? Danny, um, take yourself off mute. No, Danny. Uh, Chris W. Uh, would like you to ask your question, please. Chris, uh, good evening. Hello, Chris. No, Chris. Let's go to. I'm just going further across. Let me ask you, answer a couple of questions that have been getting. Uh, put your hand up in the, um, you'll see, you, you can just ask a question, you'll, and I'll get to see a, a hand uh, sign. Um, can you clearly, this is on Shrimper's own, Rara Blue, can you clarify, define the responsibilities of each position, i.e. head coach, assistant coach, first team coach? Well, I kind of have, but um, I think that their primary objective is to coach the team, motivate the team, develop the team, and be part of a process with other people at the football club <laughs> that make decisions on incomings and outgoings. In other words, the old orthodoxy of a manager that does everything, that calls his mate, the agent, and says, uh, bring me six of your clients, those days have ended because we can't guarantee that the best players will come into the club. So absolutely, Kevin Mayer and the, the technical staff will have every opportunity to get everything that they want into the dressing room. Stan, we're looking for this. Stan, we're looking for that. But it will be a more uh, open and collegiate approach as to how we then recruit players because a head of recruitment has to be involved, uh, head coach has to be involved, CEO has to be involved. And that way you're getting more checks and balances and you're not getting a situation whereby an old school manager is picking up the phone and all of a sudden you say, South End United have the 11 players that went out to play at uh, Roots Hall uh, in February 2022, eight of them were the clients of Stan Collymore Agency. We're not doing that anymore. 
Um, anybody else would like any to answer, ask any questions? I can see Leslie Hicks there and Paul Yeomanson, Joe Fitzgerald. Leslie, would you like to uh, to pile in? Good evening. Do you want to take yourself off mute? Nice to see you again. Hello. Hey, Leslie. Yeah. Take yourself off mute. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you now. Good grab, great. Um, so in your communications to date, Stan, you, you've talked about fans being kept up to date regarding the decisions that have been made within the club. And I know that you've actually touched on that briefly and you spoke about the intention to have regular Zoom calls. Um, but my suggestion would that perhaps we need something a little bit more holistic than that. Um, than just the Zoom call. So yes, is that yes. something that you will be talking to Tom and his team about getting in place? Leslie, you invite me down, I think I said to this on the last Zoom call, bi-weekly, monthly, whenever we think between us, and again, this is a two-way process. I'm not saying I need to turn up every month or you're going to get the benefit, is that whenever's good for you guys as well, um, is that the whole process only works if every part of the football club is aligned and it won't be perhaps as detailed because we've just had a new coaching system and set up. Hopefully I'll be confirmed tomorrow in the role, which I will show you how many roles that I'm, I'm going across, which is why it's a, a more nebulous role um, because I want to bring fans along and, and you guys are desperately important to where we need the football club to go. Um, is that whether it's weekly, bi-weekly, once every three weeks, once every month, let's find a really good venue that we can get 200, 300, native 500 uh, in, and we do a regular update where questions are asked, uh, answers are given clearly, they're minuted by the trust or other people, and that you can hold us to account. Mm -hmm. I, think, I, I don't think we can be any clearer than that. Um, Tom is absolutely on board uh, with this. Uh, I am because I want to meet you. I want to hear you. Um, you haven't been heard for way too long. I said to the players in the dressing room before the game at Chertsey, I said the way that some of you have been treated is appalling by, by some managers and people because we need to do things properly. You don't throw a player under the bus that's fragile in confidence. You pull him into your office and you have a discussion with him. If we can't do those basic things, mm -hmm. it's no wonder that we're in the current position that we're in. So I hear SOS, Scott knows, we keep in touch. I hear the trust, we keep in touch. I'm across all younger South End United fans, older South End United fans that are a little bit concerned. This is artsy fartsy stuff, isn't it, Stan? It's all smoke and mirrors. No, we'll be accountable to you. We just want you to come along with us and to give us the courtesy of, instead of hearing your mate Dave that said, I heard Collie Moore say on Twitter, three weeks ago and my mate said and his sister said come along yourself ask the questions yourself walk away with an answer that then you can go to bed at night and say you know what he fronted it up he answered the question and we're all part of the process mm. that's how modern football clubs work and I'm passionate about it because at several football clubs that I've been involved in South End United Liverpool Aston Villa Leicester City, Bradford City and Crystal Palace have all either skirted very close to the edge or in some cases it's been 11.59 and 59 seconds before the next Messiah comes and buys them and then you repeat the process in years to come. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do it for you. That's it. We want you to go into Roots Hall or Fossett's Farm and to feel that, that your football club suits your values and morals and ethics and the football team is playing in a way that you want it to play, uh, that the people employed by the football club are accountable. And, and me speaking to you guys, I'll talk to you till two, three, four in the morning and ask, answer every question. I'll come down tomorrow morning, if you can get 100 of you together, that get the broad brush of support and give you the information that you need and then hold me accountable. Hold the CEO accountable. Hold Kev accountable. Hold Benno accountable. Hold the physio uh, you know, what I said about a physio, that the club are on it. That's what we need to do. Um, okay. Thank you very much for your question. Matt, uh, Matt E, uh, good yeah. evening to you. Hi, Stan, good evening. Thanks for the call. You're Thanks welcome. for your involvement so far. Um, what have you done with Ron? Uh, what's his involvement 
going to be in, in the there, future. He's in my cupboard, <laughs> tied up with gaffer tape. And uh, no, when I spoke to Ron in summertime, and Ron and I didn't speak before that, for 2003, we actually met because um, I, same thing, I said, I can help the club. And at that stage, I was a man in my early 30s. So I put my, my name in the app for the managerial job before Tilly got it. And Tilly was the right man to get the job. So, you know, it's like what we want to do is, is negate as many bad decisions as we possibly can. And if you make two really good hires out of six, that's not good. If you make five really good hires out of six, that's really good. So we want to make, make sure that there's checks and balances across the club to make more good, good decisions than bad ones. When I spoke to Ron, the club didn't have a CEO. So Ron is spinning plates everywhere, Fawcett's farm, which takes up an inordinate amount of his time. Some of when I've been, excuse my French, pissed off with Ron, is he says, Stan, I'll give you a call tomorrow at 10 a.m. The phone call doesn't come. And I say, to Tom, he said he's going to call me at 10, just basics. If we, if we start the Zoom call, Tom, at seven, be there for seven. Um, and he says, he's, honestly, Stan, he's, he's spinning plates left, right and centre. So I went to him and said, don't spin any more plates. You are the owner of the football club. Put the right pieces in the right places. Could you take a step back? And he said, I, I want to take a step back. He said, because I do care about the football club. Now, you guys have to disseminate what Ron says over 10 years, not 10 days or 10 months. Um, he called me tonight and he genuinely seemed very chuffed that the... That, that everybody saw the process that we said we would deliver and that he was one quarter of that process and it felt good. It, you could tell it felt good to him that he didn't have to go, I'm just going to call up so-and-so and he's going to recommend Mark Moldsley to me or Phil Brown's coming back or Sol Campbell. Is that he felt comfortable because he felt that there were people at the club and I've banged away I'll message him and email him one in the morning. When is this madness going to stop, Ron? Uh, uh, half time, I think, in the, the Chesterfield game. And Ron wasn't at the game. I can speak to Ron with a little bit more edge than other people because I don't need to be here. And he knows I don't need to be here. I'm offering, you know, I, I, I haven't taken a, a brass farthing from South End United Football Club since 1992. So 1993. So he knows that it's not about money. It's not about position and cash. Because I have a good, what I you know I can I can work for companies and and uh, I've got a big social media profile. So he, he he knows that, and I think he realizes he doesn't need to be. Here. So what's he angling for? It's not going to make him a wealthy man. It's not going to do this. It's not going to do that. It's not going to do the other. So I think that Ron, particularly in the meetings in London was collegiate, he listened, he accepted the football questions coming from me. Um, and I would, if Ron went off on a tangent about football, I would jump in and say, I want us to drag us back to where the question that we were addressing to the coach. And um, he's, not get, he's not a 50 year old man anymore. Um, I think he, he's desperate to get Fawcett's farm over the line because I think that for him, he, it's his way of showing you that he really does care. Again, ask all the questions to Ron, not to me. I'm not a, I, I get, I see on some of the forums, Ron has Stan where he wants him. Stan has Stan where he wants Stan. And like I say, I'm here for you primarily. And I'm here to be able to work with anybody at the club to be able to get to more solutions than problems piling up. I cannot sit by and let Southend United Football Club go belly up. I can't. I won't. So whatever I can offer, I'm, I'm offering. So Ron has been genuinely Matt and all, to all of you, he couldn't have been more collegiate and I'm letting Tom do this, Stan. You don't need the conversation with me today. Tom's dealing with all of that and hopefully with a position for me confirmed tomorrow is that Ron will let me then do what I do. I don't think it's a penny drop moment. I think there are several factors. It gets quite tiring when people are negative towards you. You see the comments from Steve Bruce over the last 24 hours. 
It's not nice. Whether it's legitimate is a different question, but it's not nice. We're all human. Nobody likes to be called names. Nobody likes to see a banner coming, walking towards you across the pitch. I wouldn't. None of us wouldn't. Ron has to address that with you guys in his own time, but he's, he's, he's taken a step back. He's looking to deliver Fawcett's farm. And Tom Lawrence is the day-to-day -day El Jefe chief executive, all stops with him across the club. I know that because I've seen it. I've seen Tom make the decisions. He was the one that, um, that sacked Phil. There's been uh, lots going on behind the scenes in terms of making sure that the uh, that employees uh, are now going to be listened to. Other people may well be walk, getting out of the club in short order. That's up for Tom. But Tom, Tom's a nice man, but he's got a ruthless streak. And he basically said to Ron, if you're employing me as a CEO, let me do the job. And so far, Ronnie's letting him do the job. Matt, thank you. Paul, so quick, Donaldson. Can I quick follow up? Sorry, yes, Sam. of course. You um, yeah, so it sounds like Ron has taken a, a bit of a step back. Um, do you have a quick message for the Martin Out campaign? I do. And the, the message, it's a very good question about the protests as well. Um, I've, I've chatted to Scott since the summertime and everybody knows I've tweeted. I said, something needs to happen. And if, if it's militant, then it needs to happen. You can't just let a football club die. You can't just sit there as a football fan and go, well, I'm happy for this, 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 uh, the status quo to be maintained. Young, the younger guys like Scott and some of them, they do things differently. They're more, they're more energetic. They want to see immediate change. Some of us that are older, if you're, if you're 60 or if you're 70, you go, oh, it's bugger all we can do. We've got a club for now. Let's just take a sit back. Uh, take a seat. Uh, take a seat. Ron put money into the club, so therefore he loves the club. It's a, everybody needs to be accountable. So from my perspective, what I've what I've proposed, me, wasn't Ron, wasn't Tom, me, was a moratorium, a moratorium for four to six weeks. I think that moratorium is more likely to happen now because you can see who we've brought in, you can see what they bring and it would be fair to all of those guys to be able to have a, a, a solid and stable platform to be able to work from so let's give them four six eight weeks let the players come out at roots all and just hear come on come on boys we're behind you for 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 that period of time if we're all Billy bullshitters and liars and schemers and conspiracy theorists at the end of that, I'll be stood with you with the banner. But at least let peace reign. Let Ron be calm and see progression. Let the football department sort out putting its ducks in a row. Let Tom Lawrence come in and be able to identify the issues and the potential solutions. And let you guys go and watch some football and feel part of a unified group. Even for four to six weeks, you can start to have conversations with each other and reminding yourself what you have in common, which is supporting a really good football club. A really good... I've been stunned at how many... I mean, I don't know what the, 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 the numbers are in terms of born in Southend and then fly off to become city bods or what have you, but I've never known a supporter base pop up in all sorts of messages that work in so many different areas of the country and the world and what have you that have gone, I was born in South End, South End's my club. We used to go with my dad, used to go with my granddad. Let peace reign and let's get back to unifying a football club. You guys are going to have me on your side by everything that I said, coming down, listening to you, implementing changes where we can implement changes to, to your benefit. But please come along with us. Give some goodwill. These, these players, when I walked in there, they'll get a bit emotional. But these players, when I walked in the dressing room, they're flat as a pancake. They're flat as a pancake. And they probably haven't had a football structure, a training structure. Over, you know, Mark Molesley came in and he's tried to do certain bits, which was very different to what Sol Campbell did, different to Phil, different to other people. They haven't had a structure where they can go in and go, I know I'll go in at nine o'clock. This is what we're doing. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Results at the end. They're flat as a pancake. And we all want them to succeed. We all want them to succeed. Because if they succeed, we have a really good, healthy football club to support. 
It's a, I, I get envious when Villa were going through their really tough times and you're going and watching other clubs, sometimes local clubs like Leicester. I played for Leicester as well. The epitome of a well-run club. And I'm like, we're Aston Villa. Why can't we just do the basics, what Leicester are doing? Leicester kept a lot of staff over the dark days, empowered them, listened to them, listened to the supporter base. What do you want from your football club? Improved facilities, invested in talent, kept talent at the club to stop it hemorrhaging and going out the door to other clubs. It works. I promise it works. And the only reason I stuck my nose in, because I know it works, and I know it will work for your club. Um, Paul Yeomanson, good evening. Hi, Stan. How you doing? Very good, thanks. Um, yeah, um, you, you touched on the, the under-23s earlier. Um, as you probably know, I mean, the trusts are quite heavily involved in funding and other bits with the, the academy or the, the under-18s. Where do you see that now, um, in particular with um, Ricky's role? <laughs> and also, um, as you're probably aware, um, if we don't, if we stay in the National League next season, they're going to lose funding after about six months. Yeah. How will that affect things going forward? Right. To, to ask the, the second part first, um, my understanding is, and Ron said this in recent Zoom meetings, that he will continue to fund the club um, to whatever it takes to be competitive. And I believe that. You guys can then have the, again, the debates about what's gone in before HMRC. And so I think we've, we've significantly moved on from there because I think that there may well be some good news coming about the stadium. That's been obviously ongoing. So it might be a case that lots of good things happen. And you, you know, you can be lucky as well as plan things. Um, but, I, but Ron was clear. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom Lawrence was in the meeting as well. I watched it. I wasn't involved in it. It was one of the, the last meetings, the last meeting that Ron and Tom, that the club will continue to fund, uh, Ron will continue and associated companies um, fund the club to, to maintain its competitiveness. As regards Ricky, um, my suggestion was very simple to the guys, and I can't lie, Craig Fagan, Phil Brown, Anton Robinson and Ricky, Bra uh, Ricky Duncan needed to be um, let go from the club. That is still my firm position. Um, that is for the chief executive officer and the owner ultimately to make that decision. In terms of academies and the, the technical stuff is we've had a really good look as well. We had a sit down um, in London. So these meetings weren't just about um, hiring. We, want, we were looking at strategy and planning and moving forward. Um, some clubs got rid of their under 23s. The, the prevailing orthodoxy is in some progressive clubs, not all, is that the 23 system was built by bigger clubs because they could afford it. Manchester City could have under 65s if they wanted to, under seven, they could have an age group, they could have a team for every age group in, that exists. 23s in particular, me as a young, young footballer, you come through a system whereby you have all of the coaching with the academy, the under eights, nines, tens, you then get to under 18s, under 19s. I believe that you should be able to identify whether that player has a clear pathway into the first team or whether we loan him out to somewhere else to play men's football. The under 23s, for me, when I look at anecdotal evidence across the football industry, many clubs argue, many clubs, directors of football, CEOs, head of football, chief uh, of football operations, um, argue that the 23s is just an extra comfort blanket to see whether that lad at 18, 19 that we're not quite sure about, but he's got something, has a waiting room, the 23s, to be able to develop. I wouldn't agree with that. I'd say if they're good enough, get them in the first team squad, they're getting developed and they're getting coached properly with A-class coaches, or send them on loan and play competitive football against men. When I was at Wolverhampton Wonders as an apprentice, I played in the youth team on a Saturday and scored four goals. Wolverhampton Wonders four, West Bromwich Albion one, playing with my own age group. On the Tuesday, I was playing with the reserves, players that, um, senior players. I learned more in reserve football at Crystal Palace with senior international footballs helping me along, cajoling me, 
than I ever would learning amongst an, an age group. How many of you guys only ever, when you started your apprenticeships or, or went into the workplace, only were ever put with other 21 year olds? You don't just learn from other 21 year olds. You, weren't, you learn from the 50 year old guy. This is, I've been here for quite a number of years. Have you thought about doing it like this? So for me, it's simple with the academy is that it's served the club very well at underage groups up to 23s. Question mark as to whether um, Brentford have gone down a B team model, um, got rid of the 23s, um, the best youngsters, and some of the seniors that are not in the match day squad play with each other. And they might play Manchester United one Saturday, Canvey Island the next, Brighton the next, Peterborough the next, getting a broad brush of football experiences. So that's going to be down to the football department and ultimately down to Tom and Ron. Um, but that's, I hope I've answered your questions, Paul. Jack BA, Jack, very good evening. Please ask, ask Hiya. your question. Hiya, I, got, uh, I got two. So um, one being, um, with us looking into getting a new head of recruitment, I assume that would be Anton Robertson leaving his position. Um, and I two... So. Uh, that would be for Tom to answer, to confirm. I'm not in a position to be able to hire and fire people, nor would I, nor, nor would um, I be. And two, I know your stance on obviously Ricky Duncan leaving alongside uh, Phil Brown and Fagan. Obviously, he hasn't left as of yet, and he's back in his role in the in the youth. Um, if you were to get a position, how would you think your relationship might be with Ricky Duncan, knowing that obviously you have a strong idea of him leaving? But how would it affect your relationship with him as well? I am a professional football man that has played at Southend United, Crystal Palace, the great Liverpool Football Club. Aston Villa, I understand football politics very well and my philosophy has always been very simple. If people afford me the courtesy and the respect that I deserve in one-to-one -one meetings, I will give them back. And the, ultimately, the overriding thing is anybody that works at Southend United Football Club is there for the benefit of Southend United Football Club. I have no issue or problem or beef with anybody. Um, I'm just looking at some of the other guys. I'm seeing Joe Fitzgerald there that's been doing a lot of nodding and shaking and what have you. Joe, have you got a question you'd like to ask? You can take yourself off mute. Are you there? You just need to press the unmute button. No? Can't get it done. Right, let me ask uh, um, some of these questions. Um, Will we be, this is uh, Avi on Shrimper Zone. Please put your hand up if you want to ask a question. It doesn't matter, don't be shy. There's plenty of you in the room. Just don't leave it to the, the usual names. Put your hand up and ask a question. I'll ask, I'll ask Stan, you. there are a few that have got their hands up. Oh, hold on, I can't see them. That's the only John, one. John, John Humphrey has got his hand okay. up. If you could tell me who's got your hand up, because I can only see, there you go, I've refreshed it. John Humphrey, good evening to you. Yeah, hi Stan, I hope you can hear me okay. I can hear you fine. Um, one of the things that we've read a lot on on Trimper's own um, over the last year or so is the reputation of the football club. Now, whether that's the way that it's being run by Ron, the um, issues over payments of players, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You said you've got quite an extensive network within the football industry. So, have you found people negative? towards South End as a football club and moving forward if that is the case along with Kev and Benno and, and yourself etc how do you how do we move that forward what do we need to do to improve our reputation and obviously we've had relegations as well yeah. so I can see why players might be reluctant to come to us um etc etc um I'm just wondering how how do we rebuild that or how do we get our reputation back again yeah, these are all part of, a, of, a, of, again, a document. And documents can sound, again, sort of quite sort of nebulous and airy-fairy. You've got to have something that you can see written down that the supporters can take to the bank that the employees are doing, accountability. Um, the football technical staff that we've employed, I think, that, that, that show... Um, if, if you look at what clubs, um, former players, current players, for example, the response to Kev Mayer on Twitter... People saying, great coach, great guy, full of integrity. You do it by putting those people in the football club. And I don't think that's always been the case. I'll be perfectly frank. I don't think that in the last 10 years that there have been people at the football club 
that have potentially um, that have cared about the club's reputation. Um, they've just gone along and done a job and and uh, great. But what Kev brings is that when I, the recruitment department, identify players that we want to look at, we go to Kev and he goes, yes, no, maybe. We all sit down in a very adult manner and we have that discussion. Is that I've already spoken to loads of clubs, maybe upwards of 30, and said, would you work with us? Absolutely, Stan, because they know me. Um, so if I say to them, let your under-23 striker, or you might have a glut of, let's say, left-sided midfielders. You've got three in your under-23s. Two of them we've identified that would be very good for Southend United Football Club. Can we take them? Southend United Football Club have had an issue in recent years because there's been a managerial turnover. So yeah. if you think of it, all of you guys think of yourselves now as the head of under-23s at Pick a Club Out the Air, Barnsley. Why should I send my bright young under 23 that we want to play men's football and our department has identified he should be playing in the conference? Why should we send him to South End? Uh, On what basis would we send him to South End instead of uh, Harrogate, Forest Green Rovers, um, Bromley? Um, that they take them in. They've, it's not just about managerial flux and change. It's about wildly differing managers with wildly differing football philosophies. Yeah. They don't know one minute the next whether they're going to get a, a long ball manager in or somebody that wants to play it out the back. That might fundly, fundamentally affect Barnsley's ability to look at things and say, we're sending John Smith, uh, number two left-sided midfielder to South End, and then he goes through three managers. That's not going to help his progression as a footballer. And I think there have, there have been issues, of course, HMRC, and I think there have been issues around other parts of the football department, which I won't divulge now, that, that may well end up coming out in the wash down the line, is that, yes, I believe that the, from the people that I've spoken to, South End United would not be the first, second, third or eighth pick to send their players to. What yeah. I can guarantee is that they will, will get first picks because we will treat those clubs and we'll say, we've got a coaching set up. You can see Kevin Mayer, you can see CV, you can see Darren Curry, you can see Mark Bentley. Um, we're giving them every opportunity to have minutes with the, the players on the grass to, de to develop them. And they go, great, develop development. Their ears start ringing. They just want them back in one piece, not having had a manager saying, you're crap, get, get lost back to insert club and to see some development in men's football at conference level. We can deliver that. And I've been on to 30 clubs um, since May. The first Zoom meeting with you guys was May the 10th. Yeah. And pretty much since that day, I have been working good chunks of every day to re-establish or reacquaint or renew relationships with clubs that I've worked with before. Uh, or clubs that I believe that we should be having strategic alliances with. And that's not just pro clubs. I'm talking about clubs in the greater Essex area, Billericay, Canvey, Concord, uh, Hornchurch. We need to be developing relationships with these guys as well. So I've done, much, I've done my homework. Um, the, Tom has done his, um, very much with the likes of Mark Bennett, Mark Bentley, Darren Curry and Kev Mayer, they know the local scene in Essex as well. Yeah. A monster amount of, of population within 40 miles of South End on Sea. We need to be knowing every single eight-year-old, 12-year-old, 17-year-old, 20-year-old, people have, that have been released but are super motivated and they want to come and play. All of those things, John, will be addressed. I guarantee it. That's great. Thank you very much, Stan. Well answered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Microbe, good evening. Looking at me very seriously there. I'm a little bit frightened. And so you should be. <laughs> good evening. Thank, thank you very much for everything you're doing for us. And I'm you're sure welcome. I speak on behalf of everybody when we wish you all the best tomorrow and we've got our fingers crossed for you. That means a lot. Thank you very much. No problem. My question is, assuming that everything goes the way we want it to tomorrow, do you see yourself as having a role mentoring our strike force? If invited, but only if invited. This was something I said to, uh, to the candidates in interview. 
I don't want anybody that isn't indirectly involved in the club in some official role um, getting involved for the sake of it. So, yes, there's an obvious tapping, gimme, to ice by uh, at the end of the, it was half time, was it half time at the end of the game? Um, Rushy, Matt Rush came in just before the final whistle blew. And he was heading towards the dressing room and I walked in behind him and I just put my hand on his shoulder and I said, no, it was after the game. No, it was before he went on. It must have been half time. Players had gone back out on the pitch. Rushy was on his own in the dress, went back to the dressing room, maybe getting pads. And I went in, I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, I really rate you, kid. I said, mm -hmm. but I've watched your striking drills. You haven't hit the target 60, 70% of the time. Concentrate on hitting the target. And he went, oh no, oh no. Because sometimes he just slopes his... He hasn't been involved. He hasn't had somebody put his arm around him. This is a bit of old man's wisdom. This is a bit of striker's wisdom. Do this. Have a, have a think of that. Um, after the game, hot and sweaty. Um, Sam came in, Dolby. And I pulled him into the manager's office. There was nobody in there. And I said the same thing. I said, you've got a career as a centre forward. You can work within the 18-yard box, back to goal. You've got a good touch. I said to him at half-time, when the goalkeeper, if the goalkeeper's kicking it, look at the goalkeeper and look at the central defender. He was starting in a position where he was crouching, and Hamza was. If you're six foot four or six foot three, and your starting position is crouching, and you're allowing a central defender to put his arms on your shoulders before you've jumped, pure logic dictates you've got so much further to get up and win a flick on. So stand away from your central defender. Ball's coming. You're looking at the goalkeeper. You're looking at your central defender and you get a run up and you get a flick on. At South End, I'd win 85, 90% of my flick ons just by doing that, that I was taught. Yeah, it doesn't have to take a long time to impart pearls of wisdom, does it? Exactly. But Kev Mayer, Mark Bentley and Darren Curry, if they want that, it's there. If they don't, I'd fully respect their decision and I'll keep well out of the way. I'm sure they'll be asking you. We'll see. Thank you very Cheers. much. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, any more questions? Um, I've got here. Let me go, go, go back to this question on Shrimp Zone. Will we be looking into the age and condition of the players we buy? Uh, what I mean by that is we will be looking to recruit younger, fresher players with better injury records or we continue to buy old, experienced players who are a good five years ago because someone thinks they can do a job. Surely it would make more sense to have a nucleus of players aged roughly 21 to 29, plus you could then potentially sell for some profit. Hurrah, some joined up thinking. Um, some managers, like older players, or an older player profile, let's call it, is because they feel they've been there, they've done it, they're a known quantity. The things that have been identified, and I, I, I don't want the players to watch this and think that they're being slagged off, they're not. We are going to, they're going to be given every opportunity by the coaching staff to succeed in the days and the weeks ahead. But pretty much every candidate came in, you know, most of these guys, have, of course, um, wanted the job. So they've done their own due diligence on the squad. Um, athleticism, there are several key areas in terms of positions. And the one thing that, um, that Kev Mayer in his presentation showed in a graph was Play, players of each of each critical age group, you know, 30 to 35 or and 18 to 20. And we are chronically short in, in, in perfect median age. Perfect median age would be 20, you always just said there, 23 to 28. I think we've got four across the across the squad. Um, our recruitment, potential recruitment guy, uh, went into a football club that had the uh, oldest age profile in their division in the summertime and rectified it. And now they are top of their league by quite some con considerable distance. That's what a recruitment specialist does. That's what the football department will do. So we will be looking um, at the perfect balance and blend of age of experience athleticism is really important in this league the technical staff along with head of recruitment myself will be across it uh james schooley good evening hi it's dan can you hear me okay i can hear you fine good evening pal good stuff evening um the first thing i, I just wanted to say was uh i love the parallels you're kind of drawing between 
um, football and basically any other industry. Uh, in my mind, things like professional courtesy, networking, due diligence, proper recruitment processes, basic man management skills, they're givens in every other industry, apart from football sometimes, it seems. And I think this, that sort of I'll, exceptionalism I'll dive, needs yeah, to stop. I'll, I'll dive in there as to the reasons why. We all feed it. We all, as every, every one of us, has been brought up as football people, fans, players, what have you, that there's a messiah to come and help us. And the reason why that is, is because we live our lives, we all work, we all do lots of different things. And to have this notion that there is this one magical unicorn that can come and sweep everything away and take us all on this tide is a really powerful and emotional notion. And you know what? Sir Alex Ferguson did that. He was the benign dictator that picked up a grand old club, shook it about a little bit and moved it forward. But even he, in his peak years, the one position he changed was his assistant manager, Carlos Quiroz, um, Brian Kidd, um, mm. Steve McLaren, because he felt that that was his way of modernising a football club. But he also knew the, the cost of every toilet roll. He knew the, the, the budgets. He, he doesn't need to. He just needed to put his efforts into the team. So, James, um, in terms of the question you want to ask, please fire away. Uh, yeah, it was... Um... <laughs> You mentioned earlier on about um, sort of short-term goals, consolidation and stuff, which I think is great. I think we all just kind of want to stop the decline at the minute. But obviously, there's a little bit of concern about if we don't go up this season, which is obviously looking increasingly likely that we don't, then the academy fund the funding gets cut next season. Might be more of a question for Tom, perhaps, but is that something you guys have discussed and, and where do you see it going? I think we're all we're all aware of the effectively the parachute payments if if we're not promoted this season sort of end, but I go back to what I watched on the the uh, last uh, trust video, uh, which was Ron um, and associated companies. And Tom Tom doesn't get hoodwinked by anybody. He knows what's coming in terms of cash flow. And he knows where it's coming from. Uh, I'm not privy to that information, but I am absolutely convinced absolutely convinced that Ron will particularly with imagine you've been on a on a on a on a journey to, to get the stadium across the line there's I think it's the 25th is it that there's the final sort of meeting and whether it's the white smoke comes out from uh, Southern Borough Council is that for an owner that's been and I, I, I know because I've been on the receiving end of it he, he, he doesn't answer calls all the time. He's like, I'm in London, I'm in a meeting. But it's, it's meeting the architects, it's meeting this, it's meeting that. For somebody that's put so much energy into Fawcett's farm um, to be able to get that across the line is that I don't think that now would be the time when he goes, right, we've just invested in three new coaches. We're looking at restructuring the football club into a more professional, modern outfit. I'm going to stop funding it now. So my absolute belief is, and this is my belief, my personal belief, uh, is that Ron will, will support the football club financially um, to be able to compete towards the top end of the league. The, the, the interesting thing the other week, and I thought, again, it was kind of beautiful, excuse my French, beautiful shit shithousery from uh, Phil Brown was, is that in his last press conference, he said, I've done it to be about money. He said, but our budget's about halfway in the league. No, that's not true. The budget is top three, top two or three in the league. So a manager will underplay it, wants more money, wants more players. Uh, but Ron sat there on the Zoom meeting and he went, we're funding it. What's the, what are the figures currently top? 1.4 million. That's in the top two or three budget in this division. So um, Ron will continue to fund it because there's Fawcett's farm and a new stadium to get into. And I would imagine that logic would dictate he would rather the club be towards the top end of the conference or God forbid in League Two um, in Fawcett's farm than, than left wanting. So that's, that's, that's the, the common sense logical answer. And that's what Ron and Tom said in their uh, Zoom meet, meeting last week or the week before, uh, James. Stan, in the interest of um, <clears throat> everyone else having a, a, to do things the rest of the evening, can we look at uh, finishing this in, say, 15 minutes at nine o'clock? you happy with that? 
Yeah, that's fine. Uh, go. I mean, what I would encourage, Scott, I don't, mean, I don't know Emily's in the room, but I really want as many people to get their questions answered as, as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Uh, I, I'll answer fully because I think some answer, some questions deserve a more round and full answer that might take three, four, five I think, I think we can facilitate really where, to... where we can yeah. facilitate where people put their questions in. We can get them over to you, any further ones, and you can answer them in a full document on how you want. And we can always do another one of these further down the line in a, in a couple of weeks' time or something like that. Yeah, I've got one here, for example, very briefly. We, hold, we still hold the plane res registration for Elvis who spent eight years at the club, 116 appearances, full international. As we would still earn a fee with any uh, transfer involving 22-year-old right-back, centre-back, who we apparently turned in a six-figure fee. Uh, in, 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 in essence, is, will Elvis, Elvis be in the building um, um, or not? Uh, I know what the situation in terms of the club owning is registration. I believe the club is still paying him as part, in, in part of that, waiting for a club to come and, and, and buy his registration from Southend United. My personal view is open the tent to as many people as, as possible. Everybody starts from a clean slate, but that's going to be down to the technical department. If they look and say he hasn't trained for four months, five months, six months, we don't want him, that's the end of the conversation. So I have input, I will have input, as will the head of recruitment, as will all of the guys. But in terms of Elvis, I know that the club owns his registration, it's still being paid by the club, and the suggestion is there's a figure that the club have in mind to be able to then get him off the wage bill and go somewhere else. So that's answering that. Um, Andrew Underwood, uh, please fire away. We've been told we've got 15 minutes, so let's rattle through some of your questions. Uh, hi, Stan. Um, just to say that the the document you're preparing, the South End United, the future, to me, that sounds really pleasing and reassuring. Um, I think everyone would agree that we want to be seen as a forward-thinking club that's not always reflecting on the failures of the past. Um, but out of curiosity, what would what element or aspect of the club, um, what well, what element or aspect of the club's way of working up till this point would you say was the most positive? Um, and if you're potentially coming into the club in a more official capacity, is that you know something you feel that you can build on further? The philosophy is going to be based on on, on common sense business practice. Is that the other outside entities we work in a in an environment, in a pyramid structure of 100 plus, premier, uh, 100 plus um, professional clubs. So we're not, we're not dealing with just the, the conference or League Two. We're dealing in an ecosystem that, is, that all wants players, that all wants to find the next uh, Rooney, the next Gerard, the next Lampard. Um, so I think the academy, to a point, has served the club very well. I know that the trust have, have been very close with the with the academy. Um, so I'm not going to throw. There's nothing throwing out the baby with the bathwater in terms of the academy. There's some stuff that the academy have done very well. And one of the things that I would do is is again going back to the very beginning. If it's a three way tie between us and two or three other clubs, um, I know that it's worked well for clubs where they've had a visible presence. Um, somebody with a profile, somebody that sits down with a kid and says, and their parents, look, I've been at South End. look where it led me, is that has currency, that has a value. So the academy is incredibly important. I think the values of integrity and honesty in terms of the people that we employ are very important as our accountability. But we don't want to just provide all of this and not have a competitive football team. We want to win. We want to get promoted. We want to get promoted to where we believe South End United could and should operate in a potential new stadium down the line. So this isn't lots of talk. This is putting people in places that are going to deliver for you. So the document emphasises areas that, are going to, that can be improved, would be improved, um, building a culture at the football club. Um, but words are great. We've got to deliver it. So it's going to take a lot of hard work. I'm under no illusions um, that coming down and, and getting the staff at Roots Hall and Boots and Laces feeling good about themselves again and being a part of the club, that having a pathway for talent within the club. Uh, Jason Demetriou, you know, he'll, he'll, gonna, he'll want to go on and do his badges. We want him to be able to do them in-house and to be able to be a coach at South End United and move forward. Um, so it's very, it's, it's very much, you'll see it, you'll see the document because it, it, it won't go into sort of how we're planning to do it and how we're planning to sort of compete against this club, this club, this club. It's very much a template for, for Southend United to be able to work from. Tom's across it, uh, Kev's across it, 
Ron's across it, I'm across it. So, and the head of recruitment certainly is, he's going to be instrumental in, in, in putting much of it together. So that answers the question. Jason Rodwell, you've got your hand up. Um, please ask. Yeah. Me. Yeah. So um, obviously the support at Southend United is fantastic in this division. Always fantastic support. Um, many support groups that all do fantastic jobs. Scott has done immense tonight to get this all organised. Thank you, Scott. Um, do you feel that we should come under an umbrella? or Because I, I think there's about 12 support groups. Yeah. What's, what's your view on that? It's a, it's a great question. It's, a, it's another great question. Um, I do. I think that having dealings with many supporters, trusts, groups, the, uh, the FSA, is that the reality is, is that football is an ageing supporters luxury. The notion we all turn up age 10, 12 and you can pay on the door doesn't happen anymore. It's a, it's a luxury. A season ticket is a luxury. So it's very skewed. I know Leslie was very much in, I've just seen it pop up on the screen, in terms of that diversifying um, and, and making sure many voices are heard. An 18-year-old passionate South End United fan is as important as a 65 or a 75-year-old South End United fan. And at various age points in our life, we do things very differently. We tend to be more militant when we're younger and we tend to be more conservative when we're older. Those are just facts of life. But I do think that under some umbrella, and the worry about trusts are, is that trusts tend to maintain the status quo to a degree. And I've seen it with many, many clubs. Um, Fan-owned clubs went, right, let's chuck everything out. Let's get on the pitch. Let's kick the owners out. We run our own football club and we start from scratch. But we're not at that point. So the support, the Shrimpers Trust is the, the grand dam of, of supporters clubs. But I want to engage with, it, with I think it's Liam, Shrimper TV. He's passionate. He's getting out there filming about his club. Scott, I know how much he loves his club. It's bothering him. It bothers him as much as anybody else that the club's been in the position that we're in. So everybody has to be heard. I think there is a conversation for a unified group, call it whatever you like. I think that ultimately we're called South End United. And this is why the moratorium in the first phase is very important because it gives you all a chance to have a conversation. It gives you all a chance to interact with me and Tom and Kev and the players. And we're gonna we'll work night and day to make sure that happens. But if then it all fades into the ether, we've got even a com competitive football team, but everybody's arguing and shouting the toss on Shrimper Zone or Custard Splat do a, 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 a podcast or a vodcast or other people are saying, or the blue voice are going, we completely disagree. Have the disagreement, but have it in the same room and have it with a, a, a view of when we walk out of this room, we agree to disagree, but we all agree that we're South End United fans and we all want the same thing. And I, that is one of the most important things alongside recruitment, giving Kev as big a basket of, of players as we possibly can get him, motivating the staff at Boots and Laces and Roots all to make them feel wanted. That is being heard, I promise you. This is about South End United Football Club. It's not about a part of South End United Football Club. It's about the whole lot. And so I would be very open. Um, I know that some of the guys have got my email and some of the guys, you know, on Shrimpers I make posts and stuff. I would be very, very open to coming down and inviting all the main stakeholders in terms of supporters and independent supporters. You don't have to be part of a group, guys. Come. Tonight was about come, join us. Doesn't matter if, you, if, you, if you're shouty or if you're quiet or if you just want to sit back and observe yourself. Everybody's as important as each other, but I think that there is a time for unity. And I think that getting some very good people through the door that have gone through a due diligence process, that time is now. We are South End United Football Club. United means something. It means something. It doesn't mean we always agree, but what it all means is, is that we all move forward together. So let's have that, have that conversation for sure. Greg, um, you've got your hand up, good evening. You just need to take yourself off mute. Hi, Did you mean Graham, Stan? Uh, oh, you can hear me. Oh, Greg. Um, 
thanks for everything as everyone else has said. Uh, just in terms of uh, player recruitment, so obviously you've got this uh, guy lined up to come in. Um, have we actually got funds available, or we, we have? I think it's an, it's, I've seen. I, I, I've asked to see existing budgets because I don't want to be putting anybody towards the club that's pie in the sky. No. You know, I, I, there's no point in me sitting down and putting a, a group of 18 names together to to have the head coach's position whittled down to 10 three days in London for 12 hours a stretch. If Antonio Conte can't, we can't have him as our head coach. Yeah. Everything has to be within common sense. Um, yeah. Again, collegiate conversation. So I asked Tom, I said, what have we got? The answer is yes, because there are obviously outgoing people and incoming people. So when people say we're creating lots of different roles, we're actually not really. And I would argue as well that what Tom answered uh, very early on, he had to go about quarter to eight, is that the associated companies, Ron, is, is, is signing off on some of these hires. But please, please, please don't go away tonight thinking we've got three people out, we've brought 10 people in. It's pr pretty much three out, three in, four out, four in, five out, five in. So with the, there is not going to be spend, 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 you know. So that we, and the other thing on the back of that is, is that, all of these people that bring value to the table are gonna are gonna save the club money. Every new manager that comes in brings his basket of players. He gets the sack. Another guy wants another basket of players. We're going to work with what we've got, and we're gonna incrementally change the mindset, bring confidence, develop footballers via a head coach system rather than a manager system to be able to move us forward. So, Greg, genuinely, it's a great question, but. It, it's all within the, the, the structure and the budget of South End United Football Club. Yeah. I was really sort of wondering about it sort of more on the player side. You know, are we in a position where we can get two or three guys in on loan, like Mark Gower said in the paper last night, you know, he's scouting that Liverpool might be able to get us, you know, a, a player in. You know, we're not in we, a position we'll where we've got to get three yeah. out before we can do that. Yeah, we'll have identified all the players that potentially could come in and make South End United better. They will be given to Kev. They will be given to the head of recruitment and Tom. And then Tom has to count the beans along with Ron to be able to make it happen. But I would suggest that Kev wouldn't be coming in on the, I think it's two or three years, um, without assurances that he would be able to have a progressive group of players to work with. Yeah. Cool. Brilliant. Cheers, Dan. Scott, you got a question? I can go on. If you want me to go on till half nine, I'm happy. If you don't want me to go on till half nine, then you tell me. Um, yeah, Stan, if you're happy to go on to half nine, I've seen a few comments in the chat. People like you to carry on, so I've not got a problem with that. Right, so let's please go on. Um, um, just let me, uh, on that. Read some of these questions. Okay. Romford Blue. Uh, question, how did, how did the recruitment work? Did all three apply for specific roles uh, they are in or all for coaching role then offered specifics? Really simple. Um, we, we asked, and I want to address... One manager that was um, in his club that said on their Twitter profile, we have been approached by South End United for our manager. I don't like to speak about individuals, but this is an important one to give you an idea how the process works. Um, we've denied an approach. That doesn't make them the number one candidate or the number two or the number five. We identified targets that were in work, out of work, higher in the pyramid, lower in the pyramid, for a number of roles that we needed to be able to fill. And that is head coach, assistant head coach, first team coach, head of recruitment, um, scouting, and head of football operations, which I've talked about over six months. So I'm a known quantity. Um, we made the approach to several clubs and several clubs turned around and said, no, we're not giving you permission to talk to our employee. That's it. Doesn't mean they were number one target. It means we wanted to talk to them in, in, in terms of the process. So uh, how did the recruitment work in terms of individual roles? There were some that were coming and saying, I want to be the manager of South End United. We said, we want a head coach role. Would you consider that? And it was yes or no. Everybody was open to every position that we, we spoke about. So that's the, that's the cachet um, that South End United have. We weren't struggling for quality candidates. We were not struggling for quality young, media and, and experienced coaches and people to be involved at the football club. Scott, have you got a question? 
Yeah, it was just um, it was just to come back to Jason's point and what he said to you about supporters groups. And I just wanted to um, clarify this. When uh, things started to go downhill over the last uh, five years, uh, other groups were set up. But what I want to reiterate is these groups, most do different things. They have different angles. For example, the Blue Voice looks at things in a match day atmosphere. The Trust, they do things that help in support the youth system and ensuring the survival of South End. The Exiles, obviously, they, they look after supporters who are not local. So what I want to say is that over the last few months and years, as supporters groups, we have all come together and we do meet and we intend to take that forward. It might not necessarily come under one banner, not yet anyway, but they are working together. I want to assure people that that's the aim. Excellent stuff. Um, Scott, Scott, that's brilliant. That really is brilliant. But it's, it's just the holistic view of it. It really is. I mean, we all want the same things and you all do brilliant things. In, in your individual remits and it wasn't meant in any way to sort of like you know, diss anything that any of you no, guys that's do. fine it was just clarity on the situation yeah. that was all. That's okay. thank you uh kev good evening do you want to take yourself evening, off evening again stan and um sorry if this is a little controversial but it just it will make me feel better and, and apologies to everyone i was at a, share, a shareholders agm many years ago when the initial plans for the ground were going through. And Ron Martin had happened to say in a very loud manner that he, we'd sold one of the retail units to Dave Whelan, owner of JJB JB Sports at the time. And if we didn't play Wigan in a pre-season friendly the next summer, we, we could call him a liar. Are you convinced that he's 100% behind this project. Because if you're convinced, then I'm convinced. And I'm sure a lot of us are convinced. But it's a little reservation that some of us might still have. Always hold people accountable for the words that they say. Mm -hmm. Since being involved with Ron, right, Ron and I have butted heads. And I like him because I've sat down and I've seen him. And, and he's been battered by a lot of what's gone on. And he's also, by his own admission, taken some wrong turns. Do I believe that he's discharging Fawcett's farm for the benefit, the overall benefit of South End United? Yes, I do. And I will hold him to that and hold Tom to that and hold other people involved at the, at the football club because Fawcett's farm, a 22,000 seat stadium, is there for you to have better facilities to watch a football team. Yes. So we know Ron is a businessman and as a businessman, if you invest in something, you have every right to take a dividend or what have you out of it. There's yeah. lots of lots and lots. And I had to kind of very early on in, in summertime, try to detach a lot of the mythology from the reality. But in the last Zoom meeting he held with the supporters groups, he said, and I know it was kind of like, you know, the famous little clip. Well, of course, I can want to, you know, I, I care as much as you. He wants to get it over the line because I think that inside him, I think that he feels that's the ultimate expression of proving to you that he loves the football club. Now, hold him accountable to it. The ins and outs and the JD sports, JJB sports and David, I don't know. I'm here to bring something very different to the football club. But hold Ron accountable for what he says. Sensi Phil, please. Yes, Dan, just a, just a couple of quick points. I've only just returned... Uh, to the stands this season after years of sort of being away. And I've got to say, despite the position we're in, I'm absolutely loving it. You know, every defeat, win or draw, I've really, really loved being there. Um, I was at the Chesterfield game, which was an interesting one, when a big army of supporters came on the pitch with the run out banner. Now, I'm not going to go into the politics of that, but the positive I picked up from that was I noticed there was a lot of young kids in that stand and that tells me the club's got a great, great future because there is a lot of young, young supporters um, hanging around. Now, my question is, how is the club going to nurture those kids so it gives us a future and they love Southend as we've done? Or, or are we going to just ignore that and let them become a bit of a problem, which I think could potentially be there? And my second question, Stan, is... Um, just, just, just clarify your question. Just ask me a straight question on that first point because I don't quite understand what you're getting at. Yeah, so we've got, there is a lot of young kids who are following South End in the stands, and I think that's great for our future off the pitch. But what is the club going to do to engage with those kids? Yeah. 
okay. that they actually will follow the team rather than being a problem. Okay. And the second thing is, and I think everyone wants to know the answer to this, if the Fossix Farm project goes ahead, you said you've got a big phone book, is that correct? Correct. Lots of contacts, good. Yeah. So are you going to pick up that phone book and arrange a Legends match and get your boots on again and bring in some much-needed funds to the club? We all would love that and maybe put that money towards something like the academy. Well, get we can organise that for any time this season and get, you know, kids in for nothing. Br parents bring the kids, have a family day. If we could open up Roots Hall to be able to do that, have a Legends game, get some... Uh, I've just been invited to one today, actually, by Mark Bright at, at Crystal Palace um, uh, to celebrate the, 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 the FA's... Uh, there's some anniversary the, F, uh, the FA are involved in. Um, I would absolutely be looking at that to be able to get a, a Legends game on, mix in a few, you know, celebs and names, bring the family down. If you've never been to Roots Hall before, I go out into South End on Sea, get people, canvas them, Fantastic. <clears throat> give them flyers. Absolutely. But that's going to that's gonna be me working with Gary in South End of the community, the Trust and the other groups. Let's start at the beginning first. 35 yeah. games left. What can we give to the football department? Absolutely. But all of those things, send me send me um, my email, and you can all have it. It's open. It's on my Twitter post. Stan at Collymore.com. Stan at Collymore.com. Really easy. Send me, send me what you, you think we should be doing better, and I will go all through them, and I'll put it in front of the CEO. I'll put it in front of different departments and say, what a bloody good idea. This is what you bring, it's your club. And that's a bloody good idea, so the answer is yes. Let me answer some of these messages here because I've just figured out how to use the message thing. Is Ron now hands off on the day-to-day -day running of the club? Yes, the Chief Executive Officer is in full control of the day-to-day -day running of the club. Um, short term, what happens if the planning permission for the new stadium is not given when Ron has said that Roots All is unsustainable? That's a question that Ron and Tom will answer in their monthly Zoom call. Um, Stan, there's been a lot of talk that the club's reputation football is rock bottom. We've addressed this. Um, doing things correctly. We've already reached out uh, to many clubs that want to work with us. Uh, a question for Stan Flinty on Shrimper Zone. If the head of recruitment is as highly classed as you say, why South End in non league and not an established league club? He does, he does a consultancy for clubs up and down the pyramid. He owns his own business, which is one of the biggest. Um, scouting data analysis uh, companies in the country he's doing it because he wants to be able to help us i've i've asked him i said come join us if you if we could if we could get you across the line in terms of head of recruitment would you come yes so he would actually be going from a very cushy to say similar thing with me is that a decent life whereby you've you're doing the things that you want to do into straight into to very very um complex issues and matters that we're trying to simplify to be able to move the club forward. He wants to come to South End United and all of the guys on the panel saw it because of relationship with me. We're not golf buddies. I've never gone out with him socially. We kept in touch because I rate highly what he does. And I always thought when the time comes, would you be available? I asked him the question face to face. Yes, I would like to do that. That sounds like a really good idea. But he's, the reason why he's not doing it for any individual clubs, he does it for lots of clubs, and it's very lu lucrative. Um, what's the timeline for the other staff to come in? And as Kev is a head coach, will he have any input on player incomings or just be saying we need someone in this position? Kev will have absolute input. Um, when you've got people with talents and abilities, the more people that you can, you know, discuss transfers with. I think that, that what we want to get away from is the system whereby, particularly in football, and we talked about the madness of football, is that sometimes one manager will deal with one agent. Why would we suggest that eight, eight clients of one agency playing for Southland United is a due diligence process? It's not. So Kev, head of recruitment, CEO, and my input would make sure that the people coming through the door at Boots and Laces are the best possible players for South End United and no other criteria is necessary. Um, any other questions? Any other hands up? Guys, I, know, I see a lot of you out there that are just sitting and watching and just sort of, that's absolutely fine. 
Um, would love to see a couple of you put your hands up and just ask any questions, even if it's Ken, just to Ken's say hello. Ken Taylor's got another question. Hold on, we've got somebody else coming in first. Ken, let me, not Ken Taylor, the Ken next to him. Ken, good evening. Good evening. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you loud and clear, sir. Brilliant. Um, irrespective of you playing in a Legends match, what are the chances of you turning out on Saturday? Zero. <laughs> And this, this is a very funny thing. I can also guarantee you that you will never see me in a tunnel or a technical area ever again. Um, uh, against okay. Chelsea, we had a very young um, uh, uh, Jason Demetriou that had been charged with a task which was very difficult to guide us through an FA Cup tie. I was sitting in the director's box and I used my own initiative just to go and give him a pat on the back and just give one or two little bits of old man's wisdom, keep the ball moving, one and two touch, and when we get to 60 minutes, we'll destroy this lot. And that's how it happened. A very funny story. I was in the, uh, in the tunnel and their, uh, their, their uh, head coach, actually their manager played, um, Chertsey manager, a guy with a beard. Hmm. So they had a technical guy on the side. And he said, oh, he's not meant to be on there. He's not on the technical list. I said, well, I can use a loud anger from the director's box if you want me to. Mm. And a couple of their <laughs> substitutes started saying, oh, look at Billy big time. And I said, well, I'm just, I'm just giving a little bit of support to the players. Um, but there was some very good natured banter between uh, Church. See, they obviously bought their 300 and we wish them all the very best for the uh, the remainder of the season. But um, but no, zero chance of you seeing me in boots in any other than uh, the, the wonderful blue of Southend United in perhaps the odd Legends game. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Stan. A um, bit, bit disappointing, but never mind. Oh, it's um, all right. It's not uh, 15. Let's get, um, let's get but, Danny on. We, we've got 15, 17 minutes left. I really, really, really want as many first-timers to just put their hands up. You don't have to show your face. You can, I, if you like, ask a question. We want your questions. Danny, a very good evening to you. Please un, um, unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me, Stan? I can hear you fine. Good evening. About time, mate. About time. Um, right, yeah, I've got a few things to ask, mate, but uh, we'll keep it short and sweet. What I want to know is, basically, what, in regards to sort of getting out of the division, I think it's got to be a very short-term project. So, I don't think we're going to do anything this year, but what, what sort of philosophy or what, sort of, what are we actually looking at in regards to, to players to sort of move us forward? Right, well, I've answered it earlier on. Consolidation, humility to accept where we are in the division. I know that Kevy's going to be very big on that with the players. Players that have played at a higher level. You need to just say, I'm a conference player, and that's okay, but I want to get back to the Football League. That's a mental thing that Kev is... I understand what you're saying, but if you're looking at the sort of previous templates of clubs that have got out of this league, they all work on... 12 to 18 month project. So you can get the 23 boys in, you can get the young whiz kids and stuff. But I think if you look at previous teams, you don't want to look back because you want to look forwards. But if you look at some of these clubs, they all just work on a very quick cycle of get the blokes in, let's just get what's done to get us out. And then we'll start getting some consolidation the higher we get up. Completely agree with you, Danny. And, and I understand what you're saying about, I think you're probably talking about clubs I mean, you obviously fought well, Forest Green, Harrogate towards the top of Leeds. Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, uh, if you, I don't Salford like City. to hide, I don't like to hide what about Lincoln because it, like the carries are quite close to us. But if you look at the template, it, most teams that go up from the conference they have that initial boost. So because, like you say, they work on a two-year project. They have uh, they had a Matt Reed up front. It, the, the, the blokes have just been there, done it, and do it. And I think slightly we might be better off just angling our way towards these type of people just to get us to the position that we need to be and consolidate us in... Danny, I guarantee you that a moment will not be spared in terms of finding... We're already there. We've, in terms of the recruitment guy that hasn't been employed yet, that's, that's to be confirmed, hopefully. Um, we have player profiles, players that we can extricate from uh, football league clubs under 23s, free agents... Yeah. Uh, I understand about I understand, I understand about the twenty three stand. I, I totally mate. I'm all for the youth players, right? But I'm a big, big fan of non league football. I don't want to harp on mate, because there's plenty of other people that need to say something. But I just think that 
I just think we just need to look at all. We've got all the great ideas of moving forward and all the glitz and glamour of what of but what we are is for a non-league football club at the moment. It's operating at the bottom half of the league, right? So our our attraction for players is basically the southeast of England. Unless we're going to start, we're not going to start chucking mad money at big centre forwards and whatever else because we're wasting our money this year. So what we need to do is just. The thing is, is this is a, this league is a two horse race. So you could be you could be the best team in the league and lose out by one spot. So you've got it's a very fine tuning. So if we scrap this, if we scrap this um, season this year and next year we have a roll at the dice. Our roll at the dice next year has got to be a twelve month project. Let's get in, let's get out. But if we don't get in and get out, then we're into the third season, and that's when the problems start occurring because that's when you start getting the. Uh, the, the daggers start coming back at you and going, right, what are we doing to move forward? What's this? What's that? You said Danny, this, this, this. Danny, like, your, your erudite uh, comments and suggestions have been noted. Thank you very much. Let's go to Darren Gibbonson. Darren, good evening. Just take yourself good off. Evening. Your, good evening, pal. Good evening, Stan. Uh, just, just quick, I'm going back on the man managerial uh, number two, Darren Curry. Surely he, how did... Was he satisfied coming in as assistant? Surely he would have gone for the main job. And being a main manager before, how did you coax him into becoming the assistant and working with Kevin? We had in-depth conversations with Kevin, Darren and Benno. I had a conversation with Tom. Where are we today? Friday. Earlier on in the week. And I said, I see it as Kev has won. Darren two, and Ben was first team coach. And the reason why that is, is that I think that Kev has been in situ with Bristol Rovers and done a very good job, very highly rated there. Ben O's managed a team further down in terms of Canvey, but actually put teams out, you know, for three points every week. And Darren's abilities are on the grass as a coach. Um, I think 70, 76 games as, as, as manager of, of Barnet. And we understood, actually, again, one of these, the great things that comes out of all of this is other than you go, well, I, you have your own prejudices about who you think he's, could be a number one and number two, um, is that we learnt a lot about Darren in his time at, at, at uh, Barnet. He said, you know, we were on the threshold of the playoffs, um, lost four of his centre-halves because we couldn't re-sign any contracts that kind of buggered things up from that perspective. But we listened to what he, what his philosophy was on the grass. Lots of people say he's a pure technical man. He said, no, I'm a pragmatist. We, we work with the players that we've got. Um, my outstanding candidate was Kev. Ron's outstanding candidate was Kev. Gary Lockett's outstanding candidate was Kev. And Tom Lawrence's um, outstanding candidate was Kev. We were all completely and utterly Wow. The whole presence at the whys and wherefores and the detail of Kevin Mayer was exceptional. So we're not going to go, he's been exceptional. He's answered all the questions and ticked every boxes from four different people coming at it from four different angles and go, but Darren Curry's got National League experience. But we said he's got National League experience and he's a really good coach. He, does he know Kev? We had that conversation. They know of each other. They not kind of know each other. Darren, would you accept the role of assistant head coach at Southend United? And his answer was yes, with a big smile on his face. So sometimes you just have to get down and dirty and have the conversations yeah. and say, I see you as this. Could you go to that? And they say yes or no. And there are some people that we spoke to who said, could you go to this? No, not for me right now. Okay, thank you. Shake your hand. Stay in touch. Yeah. Um, so from that perspective, I think that we've got uh, you guys will know more than me, and I know it's been um, put out on, on Shrimp Bazaar and other platforms, is that if you look at the players that Darren, Kev and Mark have worked with in the squad, um, I think Nathan Ferguson worked with um, at Grays with Benno. Akinola has worked with Curry and had his most uh, prolific spell at, at Barnet. And Kev knows people like Bridgie and has worked with others. What a massive bonus. So we wanted to get, I wanted to be greedy. 
I said to, to Tom, can we get the three of them in? And the club have got the three of them in. And I think we've got a really good balance and blend of characters, honesty and integrity that all professionally can grow together as a group. Thank you very much, Dan. Sheila White, good evening. Take yourself off mute. Yeah, good evening, Sheila. Um, I heard that allegedly when we sat, when um, boys and you go from South into Big can we Frog. Can we mute Sheila? Because we don't want anything pejorative, please. Scott, can we keep up on the top of this? I don't right. want any, any allegations of anything towards anybody because that's this is not the platform to do it. If anybody has any reservations about any employee at South End United, uh, we would prefer you to go to the club and make those protestations. I don't think this is the place to be talking about I heard. Football, football, I heard. So-and-so is unfit, yes. Other, other issues, it's not appropriate. Um, Perry Rourke, good evening. Yeah, cheers again, Stan. Um, just a quick one on the existing playing staff. We've touched on recruitment and what might become and all sorts. Um, there's quite a few players that under the previous uh, regime, so to speak, were isolated. I think you've got Nathaniel George, who's probably the most noticeable one. Akinola, obviously, until late, was um, exiled from the squad. Is everyone being given a clean slate as, it, as much to say, you know, this is your chance, you know, what's gone before is done and you're going to be given, uh, you know, the platform to, to prove your worth as a first team player. And that includes the low knees um, out on loan, at, you know, clubs lower down the pyramid. It's a great question. And I think that the first time, again, I'm quite going to Roots all tomorrow and other people have joined and then, then gone off a little bit. So perhaps I haven't heard early parts of the conversation. Um, is that I'm hoping to sit down with Tom. Tom came on earlier to sit down and firm up the role of head of football operations, which covers a number of uh, roles and remits at the club. And I'm very excited and very honoured uh, if we can get that over the line tomorrow about 11 o'clock at Roots Hall. Um, is that the technical staff, so Kev, Darren and Mark, are assessing the squad. And I would imagine that we'll be in a position in the next couple of weeks to get round a table, so that'll be potentially head of recruitment, CEO, uh, technical staff, and myself to decide oh. who, who the uh, the technical staff want to want to work with. I would say yes, from my experiences in football. A manager always comes in and says, "On day one, I've uh, been at some clubs where several clubs where managers been sacked and a new managers come in, and the first thing they said it's a mantra. There are things that are always said." Um, you know, first match of the season, give yourself something to hold on to. It's, it's said in every dressing room, whether that's a new modern head coach, whether that's an old manager, some things in football just always uh, uh, remain. And the other one is when a manager comes in, he says, everybody starts from a, a clean slate. Everybody's going to get the opportunity to impress. I'm not speaking for Kev. Kev is the head coach. Uh, and Kev will be asked those questions in the next couple of weeks. But I'd like to get together with Kev ASAP to, to see who he does feel that can help move the club forward and areas that we'd like to improve. Dave Charles, good evening. Uh, good evening, Stan. Lovely to uh, see the refreshing sounds coming out of South End tonight. Um, a quick question. A lot of talk about the future of South End, which is really, really interesting and got a lot of us looking forward to that. But And you mentioned there's still 100 points to play for. Bit of negativity in that we're settling for uh, mid-table this season, hopefully. What is the immediate game plan from this Saturday onwards? The immediate game plan is that one of the things that Kev set out in his presentation is that he's got he he and the coaching staff have to look at what the players are doing well at the moment. Confidence is very low in this group of young men, shattered in some cases. So we need that they are going to have to be motivated. They're gonna he's going to show them basic structure and ideas. As, again, as a football man, you don't go into a new dressing room where people are low and start filling their heads with charts and flip charts on the side and what have you. Simplicity. And Kev's overall philosophy addressed, this is, my, what, where, this is where we might be when we're struggling. This is where we're going to be when we consolidate. And this is ideally how we want to be playing when we're doing well. He had answers for all of them. And this, again, was a, a multidimensional approach from a coach that wasn't just coaching by numbers, he addressed that in terms of South End United. So it may not be pretty early on. There's no way, that, I mean, tell us something we don't know. 
you know, like, it's, like he's been pretty lately. <laughs> a team lacking in confidence that is struggling to express itself individually and collectively, getting new information and a new lift from a new coaching setup. That in the first phase is going to have to do the basics, learn the basics, relearn the basics, practice the basics to be able to move forward. There, yeah. This is the one thing I want to impress on the uh, to everybody. There are no messiahs. There are no quick fixes. This is going to be a whole lot of hard work for you to be able to support the team refreshed, for me to be able to do my job across a multi-remit, Tom Lawrence, the coaching staff, and a potential head of uh, recruitment. Let's bring ourselves back to earth and have realistic expectations because we all know if you go on social media, moment a new manager comes in, Promotion assured, we're going up, everything's... It doesn't work like that anymore. It just doesn't. We're in the most competitive football environment ever in English football history. When I played in the conference for Stafford Rangers in 1990... I was there. I don't, I don't think there were any professional clubs in that level. There are professional clubs lower than us now. Let's be humble and remember that. I was, ba I was based at Sta RF Stafford back then, and yes, I was on the Road. I was on the Marston Road terraces back then. So uh, yes. lovely to see you, Stan. Thank you Thank very you. much, Ross. Please ask your question. Good evening to you. Hello, Stan. I haven't really got a question, mate. But all I wanted to say was thank you. Um, first time season ticket holder this season. I felt the club needed the support, um, and yeah, it's not been great, but onwards and upwards. In the, it's been a pleasure listening to you all evening. <laughs> we appreciate your support, Ross. And I think that, that, that from my perspective, I think as we sort of wrap up now, all of the questions that have been asked on Shrimpazan, I, I will endeavour to answer tonight or probably revisit Sunday, Monday. Uh, I do answer them anyway on, 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 on Shrimpazan. Um, the most important things are support these three young coaches at your football club all were honoured and delighted and had big smiles on their faces when they were told. All of them were delighted to be a part of South End United. Support the players. Nobody wants to give excuses to pampered footballers, but they are also human beings. And I told them, I'll repeat, that some people have treated them appallingly, the way that they've spoken to them, the way that they've been thrown under the bus. None of us would like that. We all want to be accountable and we want to say, but Stanley's got to do this a bit better. You do it, particularly with the younger generation, in a different way to the way that people of my age were. When I was an apprentice, Collymore, you've got talent, but we're going to smash you to a million pieces to then put you back together to be this monster. It affected my mental health to a, a point. At times in my career, I didn't know whether I was coming or going. John Gregory at Aston Villa called me out and threw me under the bus in the manner that some South End United managers have done. And I was finding out about it on the television prior to going in. Does that make me a better footballer when I go in? Or does it make me scared of my own shadow? The supporter base, I'm delighted, Scott, and, and Leslie as well from uh, the Trust, come together, have a moratorium of a month or two where we all get behind the team. You'll start to see positivity and changes I'm absolutely sure of that on and off the pitch send me the things that are important to you any recommendations onions on the burgers <laughs> that's what on shrimp zone I see this one bloke and he goes bloody onions on the burgers anything that you feel is a valid recommendation that could make all of us happier and more united stand at collymore.com and I will respond to you in good time and finally, remember the name of this club. I went, I, I drove into Southend the other, before the Chertsey game. And I had to walk along the beach and I came past and I had to walk past the Blue Boar. And I've seen lots of black and white photos of a big football anorak and big football geek about um, clubs that were started from the ground up. Aston Villa was one of them, just happens to be a super humongous club. But started by supporters, built with the supporters' hands, uh, to be able to provide for the community of South End on Sea and the surrounds a football team to be proud of. If we can get there together, 
then we are worthy of the name of Southend United as players, as staff, as supporters. And we will get there. There is no, I have no um, history of losing at Southend United. Kevin Mayer has no history of losing at Southend United. Benno turned around and went, when I first contacted him, that club gave me my first professional contract. It doesn't count for everything, but it counts for something. And if we can grab it, run with it, we don't know what might happen this season. But I promise you one thing. People that walk through the door as employees of Southend United Football Club will give their everything for Southend Football, United Football Club, not themselves. I promise you, those days are over. The madness has stopped. The bleeding has stopped. But we need now to unify, and you are the most important part of that. 1,200 going to, the daggers aren't going to be there. Um, supporting the boys, make yourselves heard. Don't shut up for 90 minutes. Make yourself hoarse. Go the extra yard. If things don't go well, support them more. Don't revert to, I'm, fear, I'm scared now. It hasn't worked in 45 minutes. It hasn't worked in one game, two games. Thomas Frank at Brentford lost eight of his first nine games. That would guarantee him the sack pretty much anywhere. Look at him today. Patience, humility, hard work. And the hard work has started with Kevin Mayer and the team today. It's actually started with the employment of Tom uh, Lawrence. Get behind us and we'll bring you along with us. But we need you. We desperately need you. Happiest day I ever had running out. The, the, the hairs were on the back of my neck. Hillsborough, fifth round of the FA Cup. Sheffield Wednesday against Southend. And we turned left and there were five and a half thousand yellow and blue balloons. Bring it, to, bring it on Saturday, bring it every game and keep bringing it while you see progress and we'll all move forward together. Go and get yourselves a Friday night beer and a curry. I've chatted you, to you enough. The next time we'll do this, we'll be doing this in the next couple of weeks. It will be open. It will be transparent. Thank you very much to Scott and the supporters groups for uh, putting the rallying call out there to all of your groups. Um, we're Southend United and we, we'll be all right. Everything's going to be all right. Yeah. We'll be all right. Dan, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone for that tonight. It was absolutely superb. Some of the feedback that I've seen online already has been great. There's a real good feel, uh, good feel factor um, amongst the supporters. And let's, you know, take that into the next game and move forward with that. Just for supporters, so you know, this meeting has been recorded and will be available in the next couple of hours on the Save Our South End YouTube. If you want to go that and, and take a look and look back on what Stan has said, it will be advertised and put elsewhere on other social media, so you won't miss it. But thank you for everyone for attending. The most all thank you to you, Stan. See you Saturday. Thanks, the Stan. Thanks, Stan.